Hi, hello and welcome everybody to this evening's meeting of City Hall Council's Area Planning Committee. Uh, my name is Councillor Hollier uh, and I'm the chair of the committee. You obviously I'm joined on screen by the other members of the committee denoted by CLLR in front of their names. Uh, we'll also be joined throughout the meeting by various planning, legal and technical officers uh, as the need arises and if I could just ask them to state their name and title when they first appear. Uh, we've got three items on the agenda this evening. Uh, we'll take them in order. Uh, for each, we'll start with a presentation and update from officers. That'll be followed by hearing from our public speakers and lastly by a debate and a decision which will be made by a, by a majority vote. So after each section, members will have the opportunity to ask questions uh, and if, to draw my attention to them if they could just raise their virtual hand, uh, unless it's a follow-up to a, a sort of issue under discussion at that time, in which case could you just raise your physical hand to the screen uh, and I'll be able to bring you in then. Um, but I think then we can move on to the agenda. So just ask, sorry, firstly, apologies and substitutes. I can see we've got Councillor Daubney, who's substituting for Councillor Colwick. Um, but I think everybody else is here. Yep. Okay, so any declarations of interest? Uh, Councillor Crawshaw. Thanks, Chair. I need to declare two interests actually today. Uh, one is very straightforward, just in relation to agenda item 3B. Um, I mentioned last month actually that the architect was somebody that I was possibly going to be employing for some work on my own property. Uh, it's the same architect on uh, agenda item 3B and I haven't yet employed him, but I haven't uh, discussed anything to do with 3B with him either. Uh, so just wanted to be clear about that. Um, the other one, slightly more complicated, is agenda item 3A. Um, in 3A, there is references made to a petition having been signed, um, which was in relation to the previous planning application for this site and uh, the petition was launched following uh, the refusal by the, the planning authority uh, that then went to appeal. Now I signed that application, uh, sorry, that um, petition, but I've discussed this with the monitoring officer. Um, she's content that that was a substantially different planning application. Um, and I've confirmed to her that I'm approaching this application with a completely open mind. Um, it's a, a different application as far as I'm concerned. And so she's satisfied that I don't have uh, any predetermination on this and that I'm okay to go ahead. So just for complete open Openness, I wanted to make it clear uh, that that was the case. Thank you. Uh, Councillor Fisher. Thank you. My um, declaration of interest relates to agenda item 3A. Uh, I, as it's stated in my register of interest, I've been a member of the campaign for Real Ale since before many members of this committee were born. Uh, and they have objected to the scheme. However, I was not party to that objection. And whilst I've objected to the closure of pubs in the past, I have not objected to the conversion of pubs, which they say, so I don't feel that I have a prejudicial interest that will predetermine me. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Councillor Melly. Thank you, Chair. Yes, similar to Councillor Crawshaw, I also signed the petition um, referenced in agenda item 3A and um, took part in the appeal hearing for the application as well. But um, I view this as a substantially different application, although it's for the same premises and I'm coming at this with an open mind and I'm not predetermined. Thanks. Uh, and Councillor Crackhill. I think I should make a similar uh, declaration to Councillor Crawshaw's first um, one on item 3B that I'm also having discussions um, with um, that architect regarding my mm -hmm. property and I too have certainly not discussed item 3B with him. I only just noticed uh, looking closely at the plans that that's, that's the architect, but so I don't think it's any prejudice. Thank you. Uh, and for my own part, I'll probably just mention as well that my usual hairdressers is um, attached to the cafe at 3B, although obviously I've not been there in quite a while now, um, nor have I discussed it um, with anybody associated with, with either property. So I don't feel that that impacts my ability to make a decision either. So I think with that, that done. Um, You'll note in your papers there aren't any minutes of the last meeting. They'll come to the next uh, meeting of this committee, and there just wasn't enough time between the last meeting and this one to prepare them. Um, but if we can move on then to the plans list and item 3A. Gareth, if you're there to. 
Neil, sorry. Hello. Hello. Yeah, Neil Massey, Planning Officer. It's the plan application at the Jubilee Pub in the Lehman Road area of the city. Um, sorry, Chair. Sorry, Neil. Uh, having difficulty um, getting the uh, getting the screen to uh, accept for that fact I was here. Um, yes. Yeah, sorry. I'll, I'll I'll just I'll just take over there, Neil, if that's all right. So, as you as you mentioned, it's um, the application for the Jubilee on uh, Balfour Street in York. The application is for alterations and conversion, part of the first floor and all the roof space of the public house building. Uh, to provide three self-contained apartments, a retention of the public house on the ground floor and an altered function room on the first floor. Uh, I have um, a presentation with members, if you just bear with me. Okay, confirm, has that come through? Yeah, we can see that. Okay, good stuff. Let's turn on to a slideshow. Okay, this is a, uh, you see the site plan. Uh, Salisbury Terrace, um, Balfour Street, there's the uh, the yard to the rear, the uh, the beer garden, um, has existing floor plans. So this shows uh, an outbuilding attached, a range of small outbuildings. Lounge one, lounge two, mail WC, kitchen, still room, pool room, female WC, access to the um, first floor function room. There's also um, living accommodation within the pub, uh, first floor, uh, three rooms and uh, in the uh, second floor, two further rooms. Pub also has um, cellarage. Existing elevation. The main entrance was on uh, on on Balfour Street. Uh, this is the uh, south elevation, which fronts onto Salisbury Terrace. This is the proposed site plan, showing three parking spaces to the rear, cycle storage, bin storage, bin storage for the flats, and then the uh, beer garden retained to the side. You'll note the proximity of residential accommodation at Jubilee Terrace, 1 to 14 Stevenson's Court, The as proposed floor plans show a bar area and pub accommodation on the ground floor, um, a separate, uh, separate staircase, new staircase, which provides space for a retained, slightly smaller, as members will have seen in the, uh, in the papers, slightly smaller function room at uh, first floor level. Then uh, first floor, first floor flat, and two additional flats in the second floor, with their uh, stairwell, their own stairwell, the new entrance created from Salisbury Terrace. External alterations, so that's the um, Balfour Street elevation, and that's the the, the pub entrance. New roof lights, a third dormer, a new doorway, the uh, the, the, the current um, steps down into the um, the escape stair, I believe, from the the uh, from the first floor to be removed. Um, these drawings have been updated. Uh, there is a door 
uh, members would have seen the door on the on the floor plan going into the beer garden. So there is a door to be um, uh, to be provided, and that is um, that's shown on the on the drawing, which is referenced in the condition number two, the plans condition. Section through, um, again, members will have seen from the the floor plans. Um, sorry, the um, the agenda papers that there is a there is an issue um, uh, here in terms of the internal alterations to the scheme. At the moment, the function room has this vaulted ceiling. The proposal is to lower that ceiling in order to give space in the roof uh, for the uh, for one of the flats in the roof space. Photographs, so you would have seen the um, roof lights to go in on that elevation. The new, uh, the new doorway in there, and then the third uh, dormer window just tucked between the existing and the, uh, and the chimney stack. There's the entrance into the to the rear yard. That's an internal uh, shot of the function room as it uh, as it exists at the moment, and the beer garden with uh, Stevenson Court and one Jubilee Terrace. Uh, the new doorway will go in here. That's the end of the presentation. And members have any uh, questions or want to return to any of those uh, any of those drawings before I close it down? So if members have got any questions, just whilst I'm waiting for that, Gareth, the, on the proposed floor plans. Yeah. The pool, does that say kitchen underneath? So is the kitchen going in where the pool room is? It says pool room or kitchen. Okay. Uh, it's not specified. But that's showing where it could be accommodated. Okay, thank you. Um, Councillor Crawshaw. Thanks, Chair. Um, just, just as you mentioned, the kitchen. I think um, it does say in the report that there wouldn't be a kitchen put in. It would just be the, the use could be either of the two things. Um, I just wanted to, to look at the outside space, um, if I could, um, because I just want to clarify. Um, Is within, this on the photograph or the? Um, or it can the be on the, on the floor plan, on the site plan. That's that's fine. Okay. Um, so I just wanted to clarify that there's going to be a section 106 agreement that the um, pub can still have access to the outside space, r irrespective of the ownership. But I just wanted to check that because I understand that that bin store on the right hand side is the commercial bin store, and, and on the left hand side there's a residential bin store. Will the uh, 106 agreement be specific about retaining the commercial waste area um, because I think it, there's a difference between having access to outside space and, and actually being able to use it for um, refuse and waste and obviously a, a working pub needs to guarantee that it's got a, an outside um, storage space and then the other question was um, around the cycle provision that's there um, I wasn't clear whether that was only for the flats and residential or whether staff would be able to park their bikes uh, in the outside um, space as well well those I'll answer the uh, last question first so those are the uh, th that's the pod for the, um, the residential then this you see it says store pub um, so that could be used for cycles. There's also a, a, a Sheffield bike stand in between the cellar access and the bin store there. Okay. Um, Neil, uh, if you could answer the question about the what's the intention of the of the Section 106 agreement? I mean, the recommendation it states that uh, to ensure that the public house retains access to the yard for those purposes essential to sustain its use but uh, has further um, conversations taken place with the applicants or agents over what that covers? No we had, we had some discussions at an early stage whether they're willing to enter into a unilateral undertaking and, and, and they accepted it. it would give confidence that 
if it, if it was cut off in terms of ownership, they wouldn't lose access to that yard area in terms of the purposes of the pub. And in terms of the, if it was granted, if it was written up, we'd be looking to ensure that the pub could use that yard like any other pub would, as you say, for um, storing waste, bringing in deliveries and so forth. And also it's crucial as a means of escape from the function room without access into the um, yard area, then the function room effectively couldn't couldn't work because uh, the customers had to escape into that route. So they, they need access that for that purpose as well. Thank you. Um, Chair, if, if I may, I've got a second question, if that's all right. Please, I can't see any other hands at the moment. So. Th thank you. Um, so this is just in relation to the function room. Um, and I think there was a photograph of uh, the chimney piece in the function room. And I just wanted to check if that was the chimney piece that's referenced on page five, um, paragraph 3.5. Uh, the uh, conservation officer um, says, I mean, I think he's a bit disparaging about the function room, but but does reference the chimney piece as being something uh, of note. And and if that's it in the in the back there, do you know if the intention is for that to be retained within these plans? I, I haven't got the answer to that. No, I'm, I'm not sure. It, it possibly might not. In terms of bringing the staircase up, I'd imagine they'd have to remove part of that internally. Yeah, I can. So so is it at that end where the staircase comes up? That was that's I, I right. Quite yeah. Well. yeah, yeah, yeah. That's yeah. great. Thank you. It is. Um, uh, it, it does appear to be shown as being uh, retained on the uh, as proposed floor plans on page forty-two, but I guess that would be um, uh, then hidden by the uh, by the stair, the chimney breast is anyway. Uh, uh, Councillor Melly. Yeah, I just wanted to check. Um whether this change this conversion would affect the license for the pub whether it currently has a license or whether this application would mean they'd need to apply for a new premise license due to the premiseable area changing and that sort of thing um and what ramifications that could have um in terms of parking for example if the section 106 agreement says that access to the outside area would be retained for use as essential to the pub and then if in future licensing says they can only have a license if there's parking available to staff and customers, will that affect the parking provision for residents and that sort of thing? That's, that's not an issue I'm aware of. You know, I think it would be separate legislation, but it's not it's not something that I've considered to date. I had a second question, if that's all right, about the um, reduction uh, in floor space of the function room. I think yeah. in the um, presentation it was described as a small reduction um the the figures quoted in the report is a reduction of more than 20 percent so i just want to check those figures are correct because a reduction yeah, the, of over 20 percent i wouldn't describe as a small reduction the, the figures in the report are correct okay thank you um i just had a further question on the kitchen um appreciating the report in the inspector's report i guess there wasn't seen to be a, a huge sort of degradation of Sort of community use or functionality due to sort of reduction in floor space or um, addition of residential you know, units. Did the inspector give a view on the loss of a kitchen and whether or not that would degrade the sort of community use of the facilities? Uh, uh, the previous scheme that was that was assessed in um, I think it's 2019 or, or late 2018 that that included a kitchen where the where the toilets are shown, as you look at the plan, the, the back right, that was shown as a kitchen area just to the, the far right there, exactly. yeah, where the red red cursor is. Now, that was a kitchen. And then the actual entrance to the living accommodation was in just below the red line, the red dot, sorry. And then you went up the stairs. So the, the bottom right, as you look at it in terms of the space, that was storage space, office space and access to the living, living accommodation above. So there, there is actually more space in the pub for, for pub use in this scheme. And and I guess the issue is you could, if you wanted to, you could create a pub, a, a kitchen space in there if that was the, the model the actual operator wanted to, to go along. Thank you. Um, I can't see any further questions at that point, Gareth. If you, if you want to take the screen down, and then I'll see if there are, if there are any more general questions. Uh, Councillor Crawshaw. Thanks, Chair. Um, yeah, just in the report on page two at paragraph 1.9, I just wanted to understand um, 
what the implication of the certificate of lawfulness for the proposed use of part of the first floor and second floor as guest accommodation would mean. I think that I've understood it as being that effectively without the need for planning permission you could do the same development as is proposed here but they would only be guest rooms rather than being able to sell them as as flats. Yeah that's is correct. That, I mean is that, is that the nub of it essentially? Yeah in, term, in terms of that lawful development certificate though they would they would typically need consent if they were going to put a, a lower ceiling in the function room and then create bed spaces for guess to a B&B, a pub or what have you, they would typically need need to put windows in. I guess you do get some bedrooms without an external window, but you need to put a window in. But in terms of the use at the moment, it is a pub and they can do internal works within the building as long as it remains as a pub. And so you could effectively, in my view, you could convert the function room into manager's accommodation for the pub. You could convert it into, into um, accommodation, maybe three bedrooms for visitors to the pub, as long as it's all function as a pub, you know, like a, a, a pub with rooms above. So that element doesn't need consent as long as the works are on the internal. Once they start creating new doors and windows on the exterior, that would need consent. Okay, thank you. Or, or as I say, or, or, or if those rooms were actually self-contained accommodation, not, not linked to the pub, that as well would need permission. Yeah, yeah, thank you. Uh, Councillor Melly. Thank you, Chair. So I just pointed for clarification. I think in response in response to a question just now about the kitchen, you said that these plans had more space for the pub. Um, more than what? More than the previous application or more than this, currently? This, this, then the scheme that went to appeal that, that had that had greater space in terms of the access area, they included storage areas for people in the flats on the ground floor. So I wouldn't have a percentage, but I would say around 10% more in terms of the the pub space on the ground floor is available to the pub than, than with the previous scheme. And what about the as that was the, that went to as, appeal. It, as it currently is, if it were to reopen as a pub in its current form? Um, as it currently is, I guess the main thing would be the loss of that. There's the offshoot, the, um, it, which is being removed in the car park area. That that that's lost. But in, and there's also the, the 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 staircase which currently goes up to the function room. That becomes a staircase. For use for the um, the people in the three flats above, so that that would go to to the use for the new new occupants. But in terms of the space on the ground floor as a whole, there is there is a greater retention than the previous scheme that went to appeal. But obviously, there is there is less space than at present. And also with the staircase going up into the to the function room, that that's going to take space out of the bar area as well. Okay, thanks. Thank you, uh, Councillor Crackhill. Um. Just following on from that, um, if you could tell me if I'm, I'm understanding this correctly, because I may not be, um, the in in what's conditioned in the paper, the um, fit out of various rooms in the pub is conditioned. The report after the before the first flat is occupied and the actual work before the second I think but the kitchen isn't part of that is it? Um, they, there's, I've not included any elements in terms of the kitchen I think if it was granted consent then it would be up to the to the prospective occupier to negotiate with the owners to whether they want to put a, a kitchen in there or, or have more space for the customers. But the other bits are conditioned in here, but not. But not That's much. right, but, but there's, there's, yeah. there's not certain somewhere where a kitchen would be provided. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Maybe my counting, but have we lost committee member? Uh, no, no, Chair, it, it wasn't a committee member. It was uh, Rohina, who's, who's only shadowing today, so I don't think it was a problem. Okay, thank you. Uh, Councillor Crawshaw. Thanks, Chair. Again, sorry, I, I, I've got one or two questions about the, the papers. I'm just sort of flicking through the papers to, to get the relevant parts. Um, I just wanted to understand in terms of timeline, and, and I'm conscious of um, what I declared at the start about having signed the petition um, that was after the initial refusal, and then there was the appeal to the planning inspector. Um, and then, and, and obviously, there's, there's some key points that the planning inspector said that, that I think are you know, probably the key considerations within this application and this assessment. Uh, am I right that the designation as a, a, a asset of community value and, and the um, heritage asset, non, non-designated heritage, heritage asset, came after the appeal um, decision and the inspector's letter? And 
does that designation have any bearing on anything that the inspector said in terms of you know both it being a community asset but also the, the non-designated heritage yeah. asset um the asset of community value it's been that for for several years now that that was prior to the to the um hearing in terms of the non-designated heritage asset that just came to our attention i think it's probably late february it was put on the list um i don't know if just i don't know if sandra and gareth want to speak more in terms of that sort of happy with me expanding on that element but um, the non-designated heritage asset would be a material consideration. The inspector wouldn't have considered that at that stage, although it was brought to the attention, I guess, in the report and so forth, that even though at the time it wasn't a conservation area, it wasn't listed, it was, it's obviously an attractive building, you know, in importance to the local environment. That's a question. Thanks. Sorry, I was scrabbling for my mute button. So um, just to understand uh, how that element of it works. So obviously, if it had been a listed building um, and depending on what grade of listing, there would have been implications for what you can do internally with it being a non-designated heritage asset. Is that predominantly for the external view of the building or, or is there any element about, around what you can and can't do internally when it's a non-designated heritage asset? It wouldn't change what's called permitted development rights. So if, if it was a listed building, you would typically need consent even for the internal changes because it's it's not a, a designated heritage asset, it's non-designated. It, it's a, a, the main consideration in terms of the policy criteria. It doesn't impact on what you can and can't do without permission, but in assessing the proposal, we would have to consider now that it is a non-designated heritage asset. And there's the specific policies in the, in the local plan and also the MPPF, which relate to that. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Councillor Melling. Thank you, Chair. Um, could you tell us more about what it means to be an asset of community value in, in planning terms? And from my understanding, it's an asset of community value because of its community use rather than the kind of architectural value of the building. Is that right? Yeah, um, yeah. But does that mean that, that that community asset doesn't have to be retained in its whole? It, it can be partially converted as long as it's not wholly converted as, as long as some, some of the asset is kept and what's the balance of how much of the yeah. asset has to be kept and how um, much can be converted it doesn't sorry it, it doesn't um it has no formal status in uh in in uh in planning terms but uh, something being nominated as an asset of community value uh can be given weight in the planning process but um it doesn't um it doesn't impact on uh, on the, the legal right for someone to to develop or alter or, or seek planning permission to uh, to alter a um, uh, to alter a premises. It, it, it gives the um, uh, it gives the community the right to uh, uh, to bid to buy a building if it is put on the market for sale. As far as uh, as far as I'm aware. So if if it was partially converted into flats and then put on the market, they could the, the community would be able to bid to buy it and then apply for planning permission to convert it back into community use? I think they could the asset of community value, I, I guess they'd have to reapply to make it an asset of community value. And, and my understanding is that if it's an asset of community value and the owner intends to sell it, they'd have to give six months potentially for the people who'd be interested in the asset of community value to come forward with a bid. They wouldn't necessarily have to accept that bid, but they would have to advertise it for six months. But in terms of they couldn't in afterwards convert, seek to convert the, the flats back to community use or pub use unless they unless they were to purchase them, presumably at the market value for what the flats would be. Yeah, it doesn't, as, as I said before, it doesn't it doesn't change the uh, the planning use and the planning status. Mm -hmm of uh, of the building or, or what's within the building but presumably if what's within the building is transferred from community use to private residential use that does change its value to the community yeah i think with um, the asset community value i think in terms of planning application the main focus of it is is to indicate that it is of value to local people but i think in terms of the level of objections the petition with the previous hearing and so forth it's clear that local people value the building and what it potentially what it is and what it could offer for local people so i think that that's generally from a planning perspective how it 
it, I, w- I would take it on board in terms of writing report, but it, it is separate legislation to the to the planning system. Thank you. No, that that's helpful when we're making considerations later. I just had another question, if that's all right, which I think is is sort of related, because um, in the report um, it's quite clear that um, through the conditions you're aiming to make sure that it is kept in some sort of community use and that the pub will be reopened and it there's conditions to try and ensure that it's put into some sort of condition where it can be used for community use. Mm. Um, I just have a question about paragraph 5.35, um, where you explain that it's not possible to condition that it will definitely reopen as a pub or some other community use, um, but it would be unusual for the works to undertake and the developer to not seek financial return from its occupation. I was just wondering if you could explain more about what financial return you're talking about and what financial um, done. Because yeah. if the flats can't be occupied until that work's been done, then that is that not a financial return from doing the work? Well, you know, I think it's the condition would be would be that I think it was a second flat shan't be occupied until the fit out works are done on the public house. And obviously, particularly with the state the building's in now, it would cost a lot of money to, to do all the works that they require to do before occupying the second flat. So I don't think it'd be viable to just convert one flat in the building. I think in reality that they, they, they've got to do all the works to the pub before they occupy the second and third flat. I guess that's where the, the profit would come in. But if they if they spent all that money fitting out the public house and updating the function room, then you'd expect them to try and let the public house, you know, the, the remaining elements. But if in effect no one's coming in wanting to occupy it, then they'd have to come back to us with a, with a change of use. But obviously if they came back at a later stage and said there is no demand to use the, the lower floors of the function room, we'd want clear evidence of how they've marketed it and so forth and at, and at what rate. Okay, so if, for example, they did the fitting out as required in the condition, but then didn't try to find anyone to occupy it, they just did the kitting out so that then they could sell the second and third flat for the financial income yeah. or I don't know rent them out and maybe the rent be higher because there isn't a pub beneath they wouldn't then be able to apply if they then did try to apply to change the entire pub into residential use they, they that wouldn't fly because they wouldn't have a, they wouldn't be able to provide evidence that they had tried to let it out that's right if 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 if, if, if they if they did all the works to the pub and then they'd they, they, they completed the three flats and let them out and then they came back to try and convert the um, the lower floors that it would still be the planning use would still be a pub or an it'd be an ex pub and, and if if they came back wanting to put an application to convert it to two or three more units yeah then they would need planning permission obviously we, we, we typically want to see what evidence they've had to as to why they couldn't let it and, and would also be interested in terms of what the the, the price was um, the negotiations in terms of the terms and conditions and so forth. So I think it would be in their interest to, if they were intent on trying to convert the whole building to living accommodation to try, you know, obviously first to, to put it on the market and also possibly approach local organisations if they're willing to take it on first. Okay. But in terms of there not being any um, motivation in terms of financial return to not try to find someone to run the pub or run it as community space, that's not necessarily true because they still need to do the ketting out to get the final. I, I, I guess it, I, I guess they could potentially, you know, spend all the money converting the pub, doing it up, and then and just leave it vacant. I guess there's there's nothing that we could potentially do about that, you know, in the in the short term, particularly if, if that was the approach. But whether 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 that would be whether that would be likely, you know, I'm not sure. There's no way to condition that. I don't think. I, I don't think you can. I don't think you can put a condition on to say that. It has to be occupied and operated. Okay. I thank think that's you. outside of our um, our abilities as planning authority. Okay, thanks. Councillor Corshaw. Thanks, Chair, and uh, uh, thanks for having me back for a third bite of the cherry, as it were. Um, uh, Paragraph 5.44, um, I'm back to the non-designated heritage assets again, and, and in particular policy D8 of the draft local plan. Um, and, and I think I'm fairly comfortable with how much weight we can give to the draft local plan at, at this stage. But what I just want to understand is um, there's, there's this list of possible um, things that you can assess the development against. Um, and then the development which might remove harm or undermine the significance of, of those mm-hmm. elements. Um, just in terms of how we might consider and apply, um, 
is it sort of any one of that list? And if we think that it's harming one of the things on that list, then policy D8 would apply. And then we can just, you know, decide how much weight we want to apply to it. Or is there more or less weight on any of the particular things within the um, thing? Because obviously there's quite a, a difference between historic interest and um, artistic significance, for example, yeah. or, or um, community significance or otherwise. I don't. I don't think it's clear cut. Looking at the policy, I think the key element is where they've got the six or seven bullet points at the bottom. It talks about um, re having regard to the scale of the harm and the significance of the her significance of the heritage assets. So I think it's it'll be a balancing issue depending on. I guess if one element was really strong and that was being destroyed by the scheme, then that's a different balance. And if if one element was, was just a moderate value and there was moderate harm to it, it's, it's, a, it's a different judgment. I think it really is just a balance in case it's hard to be very specific on, on how you'd actually assess each one other than you'd have to make a judgment of how important it is and how much harm would be caused to it. Yeah. OK, thank you. That's helpful. Thank you. Uh, Councillor Perrett. Thank you, Chair. Um, I just wanted to ask for a bit of clarity on Condition 18. So um, it mentions protecting the amenity of people living in the new property from noise associated with ground floor use. But um, the function room isn't on the ground floor, is it? So I just wanted to double check, is that covered within that condition or do we need to make that more explicit? No, yeah. Because obviously that is um, adjoining yeah. a flat, isn't it? No, that was a good spot. I just, I must admit, I was reading through it earlier today and I noticed that the, the actual condition below didn't refer to the function room, but the actual the report referred, referred to the function room. I think it'd be helpful to update it just for clarity, but the actual wording of the, the main part of the condition would cover the in interrelationship between the function room and the flats, but I agree that that should be updated in the reason to refer to the first floor function room. Thank you, Councillor Webb. That's uh, thank you, Chair. On, on the note of, of sound on that condition, um, we've, we've looked in the past at the, fact, at the effect um, uh, a, a noisy building might have on residents and residents' ability to complain about a, a noisy building. And I was wondering if we, um, through conditions, through, what, through the report and through, what, through your discussions, um, if anything has come out about that and about residents' ability to complain about any noise, because, you know, they've moved into a flat that is an empty pub and then it quickly gets bought and whatever, and then it becomes a functioning pub, the, the noise levels are going to change quite a bit. Is there anything around that? Um, they would have a right to complain if, if they were suffering from noise and from the level of noise, the times of noise. So they, they would have a right as anyone else. In terms of the background to the to sound insulation matters and so forth. Initially, I, I spoke to public protection to try and get a view on could a function room accept, you know, interrelate with the flats in an acceptable way where it wouldn't cause harm. And, and initially said it might do, it might not. We'd ha you'd have to see a report. So we asked for a report, the commission report, public protection have assessed it in their view that the two, the, the living accommodation, the function room could sit side by side, but obviously subject to the the noise control device as well. So they're satisfied that if it operates satisfactorily, there shouldn't be complaints, but if there were complaints, we would have to investigate. And, and just on, on that, I suppose the, the difficulty is, is, is you would put these flats in and insulate them at that point when actually there's nothing at that point making any noise. Is that, have I read the conditions, right? Is that the way it would work? Obviously you do the tests and yeah. things like that, but is that right? Yeah, yeah. Okay, thank you. Thank you, uh, Councillor Crackhill, and then hopefully we can move on to public speakers. Okay, um, I just put my hand up um, uh, following on from um, um, some earlier questions. Yes, from Councillor Malley, I think they were, um, about um, the situation if... Um, if the applicants came back at a later stage saying that the pub wasn't viable and they wanted to um, bring back another planning application. And you said we'd evidence, we'd look at evidence as to why we'd have, they'd have to provide evidence as why they couldn't let it. I just want, I just wanted to ask what sort of um, weight of evidence we normally require in that situation. Um, with, with a normal pub, you'd ask them to advertise it in, the estate agents who specialise in commercial properties, pubs, put a signboard outside and, and put it on the market for maybe six months, 12 months and see what comes back. And they'd have to provide evidence that there was no interest. I think with the Jubilee, 
with the previous application, I think it, it was apparent there were people in the city who wanted to purchase a pub and keep it as a pub. I think if, 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 the, if this consent is granted and then and they come back in in a year's time said, sorry, you know, we've done all the bit, we've done the building up as, as you wanted to, but there is just no interest. I get, I guess we'd have to the same again. How have you advertised it? What's the terms? What's the prices? What's the conditions? Just does it seem reasonable? Is 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 there just literally no interest, or or is it the case that you know, the terms aren't reasonable? And I think that the the terms would have to be offered for in terms of price and so forth would have to reflect that it's reduced in size. You've got limited accommodation above it, the yard area is shared and so forth. So you'd have to be realistic about if they're selling it or renting it of what return you'd expect to get. And and we generally rely significantly on what they tell us they've done to try to find someone don't we well i mean well, we, with seek with the, the, we seek the um information from the uh from the um management agents and um they usually provide us with the details uh so it, it would be a property um a property professional who was putting their name to to the report uh that they'd ask them to uh, that we'd ask them to provide but then, you. you know, we we then uh, possibly go to uh, a third party to to assess what they've given what they've given us um, to give it some sort of independent uh, scrutiny. Councillor Melly, you've got a follow up there. Yeah, I was just wondering uh, what you meant by the yard area is shared. Yeah, with with the yard area that there's there's the parking for the flats, and and the bin storage and cycle storage for the flats, but there's also access to the to the cellar for the the public house and also their storage for their bins as well and also for the access in for the delivery so so it is it is shared between the flats and the um, pub you can't divide it off in between one or the other i see you just referring to that bit not to the beer garden aspect of it the, the beer garden is holy there's a condition the beer garden would, would be holy for the pub yeah so is there any outdoor amenity area for residents that isn't purely functional for parking and storage but there, there wouldn't be no no. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Councillor Daubney. Thank you. Thank you, Chair. I'm very much obliged. Um, can I ask officers, is it not customary for um, the landlord to, to live on site, as it were, above the pub, usually? Um, and is that not um, often a requirement of the licence, that the, there's some member staff on site at all times? 24 hours? Thank you very um. much. I mean, in most local pubs, you would have the, the landlord living above. And, and when the application was refused previously, that was one of the concerns that in terms of viability and the, the function of the pub, you, you'd expect that to be the case. I think it, they call them lock-up pubs in a city centre location. You might have a bar with just storage above and so forth, but this is a very different entity. In terms of the licensing, I'm not familiar with whether, you know, they could withhold a licence because the landlord wasn't living above the property. I suspect... They probably couldn't, but the landlord might have. It's probably more in terms of how they'd manage it whilst it's open than, rather than when it's closed. Okay. Thank you. Councillor Daubney, then. Sorry, you're still on mute. Thank you. Thank you, Chair. Um, so that would, uh, if this uh, application were granted, um, that would mean, therefore, that the, uh, in the absence of a landlord or his staff being on site, the members of the public, as it were, who live uh, on the site and in the flats, would become those who were on site overnight. In, in effect, they would. I mean, it's a separate element of the building, but, yeah, they'd, they'd be the only ones in the building as a whole, yes. That gives me some feeling of disquiet. Uh, thank you very much. Thank you. So I think uh, we've got eight public speakers to bring in, which will take a little bit of time. So we'll need to take an adjournment at this point. Um, if I can suggest that members at the back of their screens at half past five, and we'll look to come back then. So if you're able to turn off your videos.
All right, thank you and welcome back everybody. Um, hopefully we should have with us our public speakers for this item. Uh, I can see they're all in. So if I'll just say that each uh, speaker has three minutes to address the committee. Um, and if you could hold on after, after your three minutes, just in case the committee have any questions they'd like to put to you. Uh, but our first speaker this evening is Miss Sophie Howard, uh, who's speaking in objection as a local resident. Miss Howard, if you're able to confirm you can hear me. Hello, yes. Thank you. Yeah, so you've got three minutes to address the committee and if you'd like to, to make a start in your own time. Thank you. Um, so I'm a local resident who would very much like to see the Jubilee live up to its potential to serve our community. I'm objecting to this application on the grounds that I believe it irreversibly compromises and risks the total loss of the only asset of community value in our neighbourhood. While the proposal would bring a benefit to the community by reopening the pub, that benefit will be small, it will be limited, and it will be temporary and unsustainable because of the many obstacles to, vi to viability that the plans impose. These obstacles come in the forms of various compromises or conflicts that the remaining pub slash community space will face as a result of the applicant's integration of three flats, which will leave the pub slash community space problematic at best, unviable at worst. These include the ground floor space allocated to the pub is reduced, a result of which being that the remaining pub will have to choose between having a kitchen or a pool room where previously it had both. The function room is reduced by 20% in size with a reduced ceiling on top of that and the bar has been taken out of the function room, greatly reducing its viability as a lettable space. The sound limiting device conditions for the function room may sound like a good idea, but it will further limit this already heavily compromised space. Many function bands and performers will not will insist on using their own PA and not anything pre-installed. The beer garden has been reduced by at least a quarter in size, and it seems fairly likely that it may become a convenient cut through path for residents when entering and leaving the upstairs flats, another conflict. No living quarters have been provided for staff, nor is there any parking provided for staff, which will mean that staff will have to park in the already very cramped estate. Three car parking spaces for occupants on site are likely to lead to almost daily friction between residents and pub business around access. And there will still be inevitable noise complaints that will come from forcing three flats into a building designed to be a pub and community space. The soundproofing measures will be meaningless in the summer when windows need to be open. And lastly, the reasonable conclusion that anyone who's followed this case closely can make is that whoever runs the remaining reduced pub will have the challenge of a landlord who never wanted those facilities there in the first place. So even just one or two of the above items on their own would be problematic, but the officer's report downplays each of them and then fails to acknowledge the total sum of their parts. Under the current proposal, the absolute best case scenario we residents can look forward to is a pub with a modest scope to serve the community for a time. But even this best case scenario presents a disappointing waste of opportunity. Almost every element of it is reduced from its previous potential and put into direct conflict with the proposed flats. Because the proposals are unsustainable, it is most likely that each of these compromises will gradually kill off the remaining pub and community space, eventually and inevitably resulting in a total loss of the only asset of community value in our neighbourhood. Six seconds left. Thank you. Cheers. Okay, if you could just hang on a minute, I'll just check and see if the committee have got any questions. Sure. Councillor Crawshaw. Thanks, Chair, and, and, and thanks for that. Um, sorry, apologies, I, I've, I've forgotten your name, but um, <laughs> appreciated the points that you made. Um, I'm just wondering, in terms of the community use of the pub, and I understand the issues around the, the sort of viability of the um, pub, in terms of the floor space and, and, and what have you. Um, in terms of the upper floors, do you have something in mind that they would be used for if they weren't to be residential accommodation? Or is it that you think that unless it's, uh, whether it's manager's accommodation or, or some use that's associated with the pub, that the pub wouldn't be viable? Um, I, I just want to sort of understand that distinction, mm. I suppose. Sure. Well, I, yeah, I think the... Uh... The, the real value of this building would be as a as a as a community hub. Um, a pub would be great, but um, we're we're lacking a lot in this island community. We're quite cut off. Um, there's been lots of talk around, among among residents who are interested about making the space um, accessible for youth groups. We're having lots of problems with um, uh, kids causing problems in the neighbourhood at the moment. It'd be nice if they had somewhere to go and something constructive to do. Um, also, spaces for support groups for charities. Um, 
maybe a hub for a local food bank. There's, there's lots of potential and there's not lots of people's needs are not being met in this community at the moment. Um, and, and also I, I, I share some of the concerns earlier raised about not having an on-site landlord, um, particularly with issues that, like we've been seeing currently with the site left with nobody in charge of it, which is with damages to it, with break-ins, etc. cetera. Um, an on-site landlord could help mitigate those issues a lot. Um, and, and I think also just the point that this, this whole building was made an asset community value, not just the downstairs bit. So I feel that as a, as a resident who's interested, I feel like I've got a right to be interested in the whole building and not just a small pub. Thank you. Um, Councillor Galvin. Thank you, Chair. Could I ask uh, the young lady, why does she think then that the pub was closed and does she know when it was closed? And I may well have a supplementary. Um, I don't know a lot about the whole history of the pub. Um, I, I think we might have some speakers coming on later who will be able to answer that question a bit better. I've lived in this neighbourhood um, basically around the time that this, the <coughs> pub last closed. Um, so I've never seen it really as a flourishing pub. Um, I gather it was not run particularly well. Um, but as I say, I don't want to cast aspersions. But I do, be I do believe that if it was run by and for the community, it could be a success. Supplementary? Yeah. Um, how do you think then, if it was to be bought by the community, how is it going to be funded and who's going to pay for the renovations? Well, as I say, I don't think I necessarily have to be responsible for knowing that personally. Um, as just a resident, but um, yeah, uh, there is there's, there's been a lot of movement in the in recent years um, around the country of community groups buying out assets like this, whether it's a pub or a village shop or such. There's a, quite a lot of uh, funding that can be applied for, which I think a lot of it would be relevant for us, um, either by governments or by community community interest funds and that sort of thing. Um, we could also look at doing some kind of share scheme with interested residents um, buying shares. I think there's a lot of potential um, that would be uh, a real waste of opportunity to not even explore. And from what I understand, um, there has not been a great deal of willingness so far by the applicant to, um, to, to sell to interested parties um, at all, let alone kind of community-based ones. So it'd be good to be given a chance. Okay. Thank you. Uh, I can't see any further questions, so I'll, I'll just thank you for your time, um, Miss Howard. And thank you. you. Are free to leave the meeting. Thank you very much. Thank you. If we could have next then Mr. Nick Love. Hello there, can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you. Um, yep, Neil have heard you've got three minutes and I'll sort of give a warning at about 30 seconds to go, but if you, if you want to start in your own time. As Cameron's Pub Protection Officer, I can provide historical context right back to 2016 as I visited the pub first in its last month of trading and spoke to a relief licensee put in there by Enterprise Inns to close it down. This battle-hardened publican told me the Jubilee as a whole building was perfectly viable, but not under the ownership of a pub company that charged high rents and huge markets on beer for commercial gain, which was what happened up until then. The first application was dated 6th of April 2016. Five long years we've been fighting to preserve this community asset that I got listed back in July 2016 as an ACV. And let's not forget that the applicant Tricor Developments has been forced to constantly revise and adapt their plans. That first application for complete change of use to residential dwellings showed the desire to remove this community asset completely from public use. And only when forced to, to have the application or the applicant slowly submitted numerous, I say numerous iterations to try and gain approval from a tokenistic public house on the ground floor being rejected by a government planning inspector to what we have now. Frankly, this application is a desperate bid to make the best of a bad job and make a bit of profit at least. I personally reached out to Mr Woodward to encourage dialogue directly with his local community group. This was rejected in favour of trying yet again to achieve planning permission. 
And the proposed development spells huge trouble ahead for whoever gets the pub because I have little doubt a thriving pub in a beer garden with its inherent and unavoidable noise will be not an acceptable neighbour to the flats occupants who I'm sure will register noise complaints and attempt to alter trading patterns. Any attempt to curtail what we see as an operating model which in its most reduced form already threatens viability would spell the death knell for the pub and represent a further opportunity for a further flat on the ground floor. I think some of you, hearing from you earlier, have already read between the lines already in this respect. And the future 2,000 homes a few hundred yards away in York Central Development makes this application essentially meaningless to the social and economic prosperity of the Lehman Road area. So if this application is rejected, as we are asking, what becomes of the building? The game changer is the new COVID-related community ownership fund, where the local community now has access to up to £250,000 of match funding. So if a local community group finds between two hundred and two hundred and fifty thousand locally through a fundraising scheme, then what they could do is get a further 200, 250,000 from the government to match fund that. That would make it very feasible to buy the pub from Tricor at a commercial price and convert it uh, and pay for renovation as well. So in, um, in, in complete conclusion, what I say is we need to stop this historically and socially meaningless, commercially development, driven development for the good of the community. And we want to make sure this can be owned for the benefit of future generations. Thank you. Um, so that's the end of the committee. Have you got any questions? Councillor Galvin. Yes, Chairman. Uh, do you really think that um, the community is going to be raised £250,000 to, in essence, buy a property? Because I suspect that's the kind of money you're going to have to pay uh, and, and renovate it uh, for what could well be a loss-making uh, project. At the end of the day, whereas it seems to be un, uh, uncommon to talk about profit, even community pubs and the like have to make a profit. Does you, do you really think that it's a, it's a viable proposition for that kind of money to be raised? Um, it's a good question, uh, Councillor Galvin, and something I can answer pretty fully. I actually do, because there's many, many precedents been set elsewhere, and not throughout the country, but even if you look at as far away as just never Poppleton, where the community, I think it raised almost £300,000 in pledges uh, to buy the Lord Nelson there. The game changer, as I say, is the fact that they would only have to raise half of the money and the other half will be much funded by this new community scheme, which is post-COVID. It's meant to help protect local community assets. So basically what we're saying is if there are enough people that will be prepared to, to buy and raise the money for the pub, like, for instance, they did with the Golden Ball, where 184 local residents, I think, put in so many hundred pounds each and in return got a share of it. They could do that and then they could raise a half the money. It would be match funded. And then what you'd have is you'd have the opportunity then to buy the pub at a commercial price from Tricor. So they're not out of pocket and also have enough money to make reparations to put it onto uh, the uh, a commercially, let's call it, uh, not necessarily profit-driven basis, but enough to make it sustainable. And let's not forget, the, the government inspector himself, who rejected the previous scheme, said that he thought it would be viable under um, local community ownership as well, if it was free of tie. Free of tie means you're not having to pay very inflated prices for your stock, up to 100% markup. Um, what it means is you can run it in a sustainable way, in, in a responsible way, making sure, obviously, that you, you, you stick to your budgets and using local people, um, you know, to boot, to help. And that's what's happened again with the Golden Ball. There's a lot of people there to put a lot of work in. And as a, as a local pub protection officer, I can tell you it's, it's a really long and lonely process trying to engage local communities. And when I first started this back in 2016, it was Thank very you, hard. Sorry, Mr. Love. Yeah, sorry. Yes. Yeah. So uh, all I would say is I'm hugely heartened by the massive amount of interest locally that I think would make it sustainable and enable them to, to, you know, to get the sort of money involved. 
Thank you. Um, Councillor Fisher. Thank you. Um, I don't know this area particularly well. Um, it does seem to have quite a sizable population, but I'm not sure about how many other pubs there are in competition, because clearly if this pub is to be viable, it will depend on the amount of competition and whether it's actually just literally trying to push its nose into a market that's already full. How many of the pubs are there in the area and have any other pubs in the area closed in recent times? Yes, uh, Councillor Fisher, there, there was one uh, uh, that, that used to be a little microbrewery pub as well, which was as you go under the bridge towards uh, the, the, um, the NRM, or sorry, the National Railway Museum. So there was one there. There is the Lehman Rose, but, but to all extensive purposes, that would deal with a different demographic. And apart from that, the nearest pubs are right up uh, on Borough Bridge Road and, and round by Clifton Green. So under the MPPF, that's not considered to be an acceptable amount of, um, you know, uh, space to walk. I think it's about a mile and a half to walk to, to uh, your nearest pub. So actually what it would be providing is um, a, a good community asset. Um, it wouldn't be unique, but it would be catering for a, a, a commensurate amount of people that it needed to. And more importantly, if there was a kitchen, uh, it would offer another string to its bow in the fact that it would be able to offer dining as well. And that's the, the, one of the things that I was concerned about is that there seemed to be this sort of, well, it could okay, be a pool thank room. You. Or, you know. Sorry, Miss. Sorry, right. yeah. Thank Going you. A bit off topic there. Thank you. I think, Sorry. Councillor Galvin, if you've got a supplementary now. Sorry. No, well, thank you, Mr. Love. Um, and similarly, you're, you're free to leave the meeting now. I can't see any further questions. So thank you for your time this evening. Thank you. Uh, next on our list then is Mr. Luke Thompson, um, who's speaking on behalf of the Lehman Road Residents Association. Um, also an objection, if you can hear me. Hi there. Yeah, am I coming through? Okay. Thank you for coming through fine. Um, and yeah, you'll have heard you've got three minutes, and I'll good morning. It's about thirty seconds, 30 seconds to go. So please make a start in your own time. Perfect, thank you. Um, yep, as the chair said, uh, I'm the chair of the Lehman Road Residents Association. Um, I was also present at the previous appeal. Uh, for the old plans on the Jubilee. Um, so just to give you a bit of context, um, during the time frame of the previous appeal on the run for that, um, in the space of one to two months, about a thousand people, most of them local residents, um, signed a petition that we organised opposing the original plans and supporting a community bid for the pub itself. Um, I'd just like to reiterate that this sentiment is still alive and well as dedicated volunteers have set up a new group to oppose these plans and form a vision for the Jubilee as a true community asset. Um, and just to reiterate what Nick has said, this has happened around the UK and in York itself uh, with the example of the Golden Ball. Uh, and this is with the buy-in of local communities and with the assistance of grants from non-governmental bodies, charities, and non-profit organisations and other parts of the third sector. Um, there are several members of this group here speaking or who have already spoken today. Um, I only wish to speak in support of local residents voicing their opposition to this development. Uh, we fully share their concerns that these plans do not preserve adequate community facilities and that the pub setup is inherently unviable in the face of inevitable noise complaints from residents in the proposed accommodation, as well as commercial limitations on business through the lack of space for pub facilities, which themselves compete with community space, as we've seen with the uh, confusion around the kitchen pool room area already. Um, and that was all I had to say there. Thank you. Um, I'll just ask if there's any questions from the committee. And I'm Councillor Galvin, I think. Yeah, I mean, I, I'd like to ask the gentleman the same question that I've asked before. Um, is he confident that he can raise the money, or the starting money, as has been suggested, a half of what it's going to cost because he can get the rest of the government? Is he confident that kind of money can be raised? That's number one. And number two, it seems to be an underlying thread here that if we refuse permission, it's going to force the hand of the owner to sell it to whomsoever. Is that a, a course of action you would like to see as well? Thank you. Uh, with regards to the first point, I believe that Nick answered that fairly comprehensively. Um, that there is evidence of funding uh, having been made available, whether that's from community uh, buy-in through sort of shares and co-ops or uh, whether from funding from uh, non-governmental bodies and other parts of the third sector um, so there is definitely a possibility for that um, I'm not part of the group specifically that is sort of looking into that so I can't speak 
exactly, but there is definitely potential. You can see it's happened in York with the golden ball itself. Um, and on the second point, uh, again, I can't really say one way or the other. Um, I'm just here to reiterate in uh, my support of local residents who are opposed to the plans. Thank you. Um, I can't see any further questions. So similarly, just thank you for your time this evening. Um, would you please leave the meeting? But if um, next we could have Mr. Paul Crossman, if you're able to hear me. Hello, can you, yes, can you hear me? Yep, we can hear you. Um, and you'll have heard you've got three minutes and if you want to make a, a start in your own time. Okay, lovely, thanks. Okay, my name is Paul Crossman. I'm a local pub operator and also chair of the new campaign for pubs. I've run pubs in York for over 13 years and I've written and spoken extensively about their protection, viability and the threats facing them. I've also attended meetings in Westminster on the subject, including giving verbal evidence to the Treasury Select Committee. Ten years ago, I addressed this committee about another pub in the Holgate Ward, the Volunteer Arms, similarly a run-down pub co-disposal site subject to a residential planning application. That one was also recommended for acceptance, and to their great credit, the committee voted the plans down by a narrow majority, with no dreaded repercussions, and I'm very proud to say that the pub is still serving the St Paul's community under our ownership and is now hugely valued, despite the fact that at the time there was absolutely no local will to save it, in marked contrast to the great groundswell of community feeling that, so, that has arisen around the Jubilee. This is the third time I've spoken at meetings about the Jubilee. It's a classic case study of everything afflicting so many of our suburban community pubs at present, run into the ground over many years by a succession of large pub companies under an unsustainable business model which seeks only to extract maximum profit in return for minimal investment and then quite typically narrowly marketed and discreetly sold as a spent disposal site with the emphasis on development potential. The applicant purchased it with the clear intention of maximizing residential return, initially proposing no less than four flats. The application was tweaked and altered over the intervening years, culminating in a rejection at inspectorate level. This new application simply takes the inspector's points and attempts to satisfy them in the most minimal way possible. It proposes a meager lock-up pub a classic Trojan horse tactic so that the applicant can continue to pursue maximum financial residential yield. The vastly diminished pub that is left within these new plans is simply not a viable proposal. The overdevelopment of the upper floors into three tiny private flats will inevitably result in noise issues which cannot be completely prevented. These floors should be retained as they are to provide managers accommodation and other space that can support the overall pub business. This especially includes the fine staircase and the quite exceptional function room, which is being frankly ruined under these plans in terms of size, character and accessibility in a way which will render it virtually useless to the community. The pub has been inconsistently and evasively marketed by the applicant and has been poorly preserved and secured under his ownership. To the point, that it, was deemed, to the point that it was deemed unsafe for the inspector to visit, and it has now been the subject of vandalism, neglect, and recently attempted arson. The new proposal to offer it to, to a potential tenant as a basic shell to be fitted out by them at their own very considerable expense is pretty much guaranteed to deter any serious, experienced, or competent operators. So to conclude, approval of this scheme will mean the end of the pub and the loss of an extraordinarily well-equipped and located historic community, community facility. The committee should reject it with confidence that another appeal would fail, as did the last, and the applicant should revisit the credible offers that remain open for the pub as a going concern and divest himself of this failed speculative development purchase. Thank you. Thank uh, you. Just bear with me a minute. I'll just ask if the committee have any questions. I can see Councillor Crawshaw. Thanks, Chair, and, and uh, good evening, Mr. Crossman. Um, you are probably the person who has the most expertise out of all of us here around running pubs and... Um, you said, I think, that um, as it as it's being presented as a shell, um, it wouldn't be something that would be um, attractive to you as a as a potential um, person to take over. Can you explain what what would be required to make it an attractive prospect for you? Um, I mean, is it a case of it just needs to be left exactly as it is, or is there any sort of development that you could see that could happen that would 
still enable it to be functioning as a as a viable pub and attractive to you as a as a potential operator. I mean, I'm obviously not asking you to market yourself, but as somebody with mm. expertise who operates pubs, you, you know, to look at it and go, yeah, I can see how that would work. Uh, yeah, well, I was among the first people to go and go and look at the pub because it's always been such an interesting site from the outside. I've never been inside it actually. Uh, I would. I, it's a very interesting site and it is it needs to remain intact as it is that's basically the bottom line the function room is a massive asset to it um taking the ceiling off and putting two flats above it is madness i'm afraid moving the staircase to a narrow back staircase that's going to be difficult to access for a lot of people is is just not going to work if it remains as it was you could run it as well it needs to be bought freehold, I think. I don't think, and I certainly wouldn't be interested in leasing it um, from the current owner. Um, if it was bought freehold, you could uh, do up the, the manager's accommodation. You could put a manager in there, good quality manager with a good quality home, which is crucial to what we've done. We did this at the Volunteer Arms. We spent more money on the flat upstairs than we did on the pub initially because we wanted to attract a good quality operator. Uh, and that manager's been there for the entirety of that 10 years, doing a great job. And that pub has been revived with actually fairly minimal investment. I, I, can, I, you know, I heard Councillor Galvin expressing concerns about how much investment would be required. It would be more so in this case, because I'm afraid the applicant has let the whole site fall into such chronic disrepair that it would require a slightly more investment. But that manager's accommodation is critical to making the whole thing work. You need somebody living on site in a suburban community pub to actually supervise the, 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 the whole premises and keep it safe and keep it functioning well for the community. I'm afraid a lock-up pub Oh, and the other thing is, of course, that accommodation. Sorry, thank, thank you, Mr. Crossman. I think I think we were getting we had the answer ready to Councillor Crawshaw's question. He wants to come back. Thank you. It's an, an, an apologies, Chair. I, th I think Mr. Crossman sort of was straying into where I wanted my next question to be, which was just around understanding the importance uh, or otherwise of having uh, a manager on site and and whether or not, again, in his experience. Um, it would be at all attractive to go to a, 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 they called lockup pubs where you don't have a, an on-site manager. Um, so, uh, sorry, Chair, I'm sure he, you'd want Mr. Crossman to be brief, but if you could just explain to us a little bit about what that means, um, that would be really helpful. Okay, well, the lockup pub thing is afflicted pubs all over the country, especially in London, where where the property is so valuable. Um, a lockup pub simply doesn't work in these situations. It won't serve a community function. The accommodation needs to form part of the remuneration package for, for the staff, apart from anything else. So there's actually a financial imperative as well. Um, it, it simply is not the same proposition as a, as, as a fully functioning, occupied, managed pub. Thank you very much. Um, I can't see any further questions. So, Samina, thank you for your time this evening and you're, you're free to leave. Thank you. We could next have Mr. Lawrence McNamara. Uh, hello, can I be heard clearly? Yes, we can hear you. Um, yeah, thank you. Three minutes and if you want to, to make a start on your own time. Uh, thank you. Uh, I live in Rosebury Street near the Jubilee. Um, I'm not a planning lawyer, but I am a legal academic and I work in the law school at the University of York. And what I want to do is explain why you can and should reject this application with confidence. And as you know, and this is at page 17 of the report, para 5.24, um, to refuse the application because of the manager's accommodation or many other reasons you've heard, you need to do two things. You need to have regard to consistency in decision making and you need to have clear reasons for disagreeing with the inspector's decision. So on these, consistency should lead you to refuse the application because all of us, including the developer who bought an asset of community value, we should all expect the committee will give considerable weight to protecting ACVs and because that's what it's done before. And so the Carlton Tavern is a plain illustration and a clear precedent here. On the reasons for disagreeing, the manager's accommodation first. The inspector made an error in the report because he made a finding that's inconsistent with the evidence. And at 5.21 of the report, you'll see the evidence, as we've heard, made it clear that the manager's accommodation was essential, not least for viability and security. Um, that evidence, and you've just heard it again, has never been contested. All the evidence the inspector heard about offers to buy the Jubilee, those offers were made for the entire building with the manager's accommodation. 
But what happens then is the inspector makes a finding that a smaller pub is viable without the accommodation. And that's the problem, because in the language of judicial review standards, these conclusions are entirely inconsistent with the evidence. They haven't taken account of relevant considerations, what's been heard, and they have failed to provide adequate reasons for that decision. There's no reasons at all. And this is one reason the committee should confidently disregard that inspector's decision and refuse this application. The second point is sustainability, where there's another error. You failed to consider um, paragraph 92A of the NPTF, which is about sustainable communities. Paragraph 92A was mentioned in the Carlton Tavern decision, but has never been mentioned around the Jubilee. And it matters because retaining the Jubilee in its entirety, as you've heard, that provides the flexibility and viability that's needed for sustainability. The report at 535 wrongly assumes that developers' financial return will come through a pub. That would be a disastrously poor return for the developer. The real return is about when the whole building becomes flat. That's why he bought it. He has no incentive to make the pub viable and literally several hundred thousand reasons not to make it viable. And if the smaller licensed premises are not viable, the inevitable fate of the pub will be that it disappears, and it becomes all flats, and you'll leave your community with nothing. And that is uh, what I would say is why you can and should reject the application. Thanks. Thank you. Um, I'll just ask if the committee have got any questions. I can't see any. So I'll thank you for your time this evening. Um, and similarly, you're free to leave us. Thank you. Thank you. Next, have Miss Shannon Edwards. Hello. Hello. Yep, we can hear you. Um, yep, and you'll heard you've got three minutes to address the committee. And if you, if you want to make a start. Thank you. Hello, councillors. I'm Shannon, a resident of Salisbury Terrace, and I object to this proposal. I nominated the Jubilee to become a locally listed heritage asset. For the council's approval of this, I thank you. This proposal will cause the unacceptable loss of the communal value of the Jubilee. It will devastate any feasibility of the pub being successful and remove its original layout as an improved pub. Historically, these targeted respectable drinkers and provided a range of eating and entertainment facilities in an attempt to reduce drunkenness. By removing the landlord accommodation, self-contained function room and dedicated games room, the Jubilee is reduced to nothing but drinking space with no food provision or overnight management and would inevitably become a public nuisance. From local understanding, much of the historic pub interior and fittings has been removed or had fallen into disrepair due to conscious neglect. Significant conversion would pose further irreversible harm to the architectural value of this heritage asset. The proposal seeks to remove the outbuildings to facilitate residential parking on site. Despite the design and access statement referring to these as modern, in fact they are of the original 1897 Sir Walter Briley design as seen in the 1909 OS map, and removal of them is an unacceptable loss of original fabric. Furthermore, the little classical dormers identified by the conservation officer as features of significance are boxed in behind the two flats squeezed into the attic. As well as the only heritage asset, the pub is the only asset of community value in our island community. The Jubilee can no longer serve its purpose of furthering the social well-being and interests of the local community if this proposal is granted. The National Planning Policy Framework calls the development to function well and to add to the overall quality of the area not just for the short term, but over the lifetime of the development. It is clear this proposal amounts to unsustainable development and the reduced pub will soon fail. This fact is not unknown to the applicant. The Trojan horse method of complete residential conversion in stages is a well-known tactic of pub developers and Tricor are well-known pub developers. In Wakefield alone, the Jolly Miller, the Crown Inn and the Slipper have all undergone full conversion by the company. Now, Mr. Dominic Woodward of Tricor Development, according to the company's Facebook post of September 15, 2018, thinks, and I quote, The problem with committees are that they are made up in part by local councillors who have absolutely no idea on planning policy and planning law. They are just people who decide whether they like something or not. They don't have to be impartial and can sometimes be downright obstructive. But I know this planning committee understands the needs of our community and the significance of this Briley gem. 
If this proposal were granted, it would render us a community with no community space and little facilities to meet our day-to-day needs. With York Central's 2,500 new homes literally on our horizon and no pub or community space yet in the plan, to allow the destruction of the Jubilee, which fulfills both of these purposes for purely financial developer gain, would leave our small island of terraces, an isolated community, set adrift and apart. Please refuse this application. Thank you. Um, I'll just ask if there's any questions from the committee. I can't see any, so I will thank you for your time this evening as well, and you're also free to leave the meeting. Thank you. If we could next have then Councillor Taylor. Hi Chair, can you hear me? Yeah, we can hear you and I'm sure you know, you know what you're doing. <laughs> thank you, I'll make a start. This application is more complex and cynical than it looks to the casual eye. It is a Trojan horse and is the applicant's latest effort to game the system so that in short time, as the community space tokenistically left in the plans is rendered unviable, they can convert the entire building into flats. This report suggests that issues from the 2019 appeal relating to the function room and beer garden have been addressed. Anyone who knows anything about this or similar cases will know that this is at best unduly generous to the applicant and at worst a harmful position. They are both significantly reduced in size, functionality and put directly at odds with the flat that the applicant is trying to squeeze in. They are retained virtually in name only. The inspector from that appeal would surely see right through what's going on here. The report uses minimising terminology like modest or fairly limited at least 30 times across its 35 pages to describe the changes proposed. These have been downplayed, but even if they weren't, the net result of these reductions, restrictions and compromises together has to be significant and will strangle the remaining community space. If this is approved, there is no way that it will exist in five years' time. This building is the only ACV in all of the Lehman Road area. This is for a reason. In the right hand, it can still successfully serve it. And instead of the applicant's repeated efforts and then letting the building decline, wearing the community down, it's actually motivating them more to save it. There have been more objections to this application than any previous ones, and a brilliant, diverse resident group has stepped up, not to just vaguely oppose the plans, but set up as a community benefit society to work with residents on a positive plan for the area and buy it off the owner. The demand for this is demonstrated with a survey the group recently put out this had nearly 200 responses. That's over 15% of all households in the area, which are four pages long and about a public house that's been let to rot is pretty hefty. This raised all sorts of ideas to help make this much more than just a pub, like a performance space, a bicycle repair shop, a home for the food bank, or even using some of the space for youth provision. Indeed, the irony here is that the teenagers who the applicants let trash the building under their ownership probably benefit from what the Jubilee could offer if it exclusively served the community. Members, this council has protected valued pubs and community spaces before against officer recommendations or much higher odds, and those decisions have been upheld at appeal level two. Take the Carlton Tavern as an example. The case here is stronger than that, and this application... Thank you. This application is riddled with enough problems for you to reject it with confidence. Please don't be duped. Please protect this building for the people it was meant for and all the huge potential it still offers for and that is still eagerly sought after by the Lehman Road community. Thanks, Chair, and thanks, Members. Thank you. If you could just hold on the line, I'll just ask if Members have any questions at this point. If I can't see any. So I'll thank you, Councillor Taylor, for your time this evening and you're also free to leave the meeting. Cheers. Lastly, then, we've got uh, Richard Irving, who's speaking in support. Uh, good evening, Chair. Good evening, councillors. Can you hear me all right? Yeah, I can hear you uh, well. Obviously, we've had a few speakers in objection, so I won't be too strict on the three minutes. Indeed. But, um, Indeed, there have been, Chair, yes. If you'd like to... Okay, well, my name is time. Richard Irving. Yep, Chair, thank you. My name is Richard Irving, and I'm acting on behalf of the applicant company. I have, like you and your fellow councillors, been through what is an extremely comprehensive 
and informative planning officer's report, and it is not my intention to quote large sections of the report verbatim, safe to say that there are a number of key planning considerations that are material to your assessment of the application. The application site has a planning history which is set out in the report. In the context of this application, the most important material planning consideration is the findings of the planning inspector, who was very clear that the principle of residential development at this site was wholly acceptable, and he did not state that all of the building or curtilage needed to remain in public house use. The officer's report sets out in paragraph 5.22 the salient points for the appeal decision, and you would have read those in the context of what is now being applied for. Chair, at paragraph 5.23, the officer states it is considered that the inspector's statements are unambiguous in setting out the inspector's view that a smaller pub is viable and will be viable without the manager's accommodation. The reason for dismissing the appeal centred solely on the scheme leading to the loss of the function room and the loss of the beer garden, nothing more. To that end, the scheme has been redesigned to include the retention of the function room and beer garden as part of what will be a genuinely mixed-use facility. Importantly, and as a commitment to the scheme, as you've discussed, the applicant has accepted a condition that the remaining pub areas be repaired and fitted out as a shell and comprehensively marketed accordingly. It would be entirely up to the prospective tenant whether they want a kitchen and room is available in the, in the ground floor. Chair, the importance of having due regard to the inspector's findings cannot be underestimated given they look at appealed applications in the context of both local and national planning policy and their decisions are held in high regard. It is clear from paragraph 5.24 your planning officers have taken legal advice and they advise that regard should be had to the importance of consistency in decision making. The application addresses the only two areas of concern raised by the inspector, namely the loss of the function room and beer garden, both of which are retained in this application. There are no technical reasons why consent should be withheld, including issues surrounding noise, and we fully concur with the officer's conclusions that having regard to the reasoning in the planning inspector's decision letter, it is considered that the scheme overall would be compliant with the policies of the MPPF, including those relating to the protection of community facilities and non-designated heritage assets. Chair, I would simply urge you and your fellow councillors to uphold the recommendations of your professional officers and grant consent accordingly, as the applicant is fully committed to investing in this property. Thank you for your time. Thank you. And I can see Councillor Crawshaw, if you've got a question. Thanks, Chair. I've got two, if that's OK. Um, and and uh, good evening, uh, Mr Irving. Um, good evening, Councillor Crawshaw. The um, first question is, is around the, the viability of the potential pub that, that would be created by following the development. And, and I appreciate what you're saying about what the planning inspector has said. But um, we heard earlier on um, a, a, a pub operator local to the area who, who runs pubs in the area saying that he felt it wouldn't be a viable prospect and, and wouldn't be attractive to him as proposed. I wonder if you could tell us um, whether or not you have similar uh, sized pubs with, um, I think they're called lockup pubs, aren't they? Uh, you know, without an on-site manager that, you, that you've developed elsewhere that have been successfully marketed to an operator and have continued to operate as a viable pub. Uh, I'm afraid I'm just purely the planning consultant as opposed to a pub operator. But, but what I would say is that um, the, the African company did commission uh, before the um, uh, appeal, as part of the appeal, Florets, who are a national um, uh, uh, surveying practice who deal um, with public houses, and uh, their views have been taken into account when, when designing up this scheme. And that's all I can say, because, I'm, as I say, I'm, I deal with planning rather than than, um, okay, sure. So, yeah. ap apologies, I thought you were, you were here speaking on behalf of the applicant. But So, you, you, the, the applicant as far as you're aware, hasn't developed pubs or hasn't taken over pubs, developed them with some accommodation and then they've continued to be viable as, as smaller pubs in the manner that's proposed here, as far as you're aware? Uh, I don't know. I'm, oh, I don't know. Okay. I can't answer that question. No, so okay, thank you. And um, I think one of the other considerations um, that, that was of concern um, was around whether or not the function room and the pub could be viable from a noise point of view um, if there was living accommodation upstairs. And um, you, you may or may not be aware of um, 
a relatively recent application to convert um, a building next door to an existing pub uh, or, or a nightclub actually in, in that aspect where the noise was an issue. Now the applicant there ended up reaching an agreement whereby a deed of easement was signed which I don't know if you've ever come across uh, a deed of easement used in this way but where in a, a different scenario you might give somebody access rights across your land to walk across your land to to get somewhere um, in this case it was used to allow sound to travel across the land so the deed of easement was uh, around saying that sound up to a certain volume would be permissible and thereby it removes the issue around noise complaints um, I wondered whether you either were aware of something like that and whether or not you thought that the applicant might be interested or would consider uh, looking into taking out a deed of easement as a way of allaying some of the fears around uh, that aspect of, of this development. Okay, Councillor, so I'm not aware of, of that, um, but it's a question that I can ask of the, uh, uh, the, the developer. I mean, what we did do um, was, was clearly commission an acoustic consultant to prepare a report, and that, that was robustly assessed by environmental health officers of the council, and they, they have um, stipulated a condition on, uh, on any grant of planning permission that we would, we would look to adhere to. So um, that, that's where we've got to in terms of uh, acoustic insulation. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Uh, Councillor Melly. Thank you, Chair. Um, are you aware of whether the property currently has a premise licence and whether those um, noise conditions you were just referring to would fit with the conditions of that premise licence? Um, no, I'm not aware. I'm not, not aware, aware of that, Councillor Melly. No. Okay. Um, in that case, I have another question, if that's all right. Um, Policy D8 of the draft local plan is about non-designated heritage, asset, her, heritage assets. Um, and it says that development which would remove harm or undermine the significance of such assets or their contrib contributions to the character of a place will only be permitted where, their benefits, where the benefits of the development outweigh the harm. Now, I'm sure we'll discuss, we'll debate whether or not there is harm or removal later in debate. But if um, to inform that debate, it would be helpful to know more about what you see as the benefits of the development? Well, well, well the benefits are clear that we're, we're looking to, to invest heavily in this, in this um, property and, and, and bring back uh, a public house into active use, maintaining a function room, maintaining the beer garden, as, as suggested in the, the inspector's um, decision notice. Those, those were the two elements that he, he centred on, retain the function room, and retain the beer garden. And so... For, for a, 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 a non-designated heritage asset, much like listed buildings, you know, the, the key is to, to get viability and vibrancy back into the properties. And that's what this application does. So what benefits would these current plans have over the existing allowed use of the building of pub and flat? If well, the benefits it, would be that, 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 that there would be um, investment in the fit out of the public house downstairs, uh, the, the retention of the... Um, function room and, and the beer garden so it would be continued as a it, it would be uh, revitalized as a, as a, as a, a an offer for the community yeah so what i'm trying to get at is that um it is possible and legal without this planning permission to do that investment to retain the function room to restore it as a pub to have the flat above it and just renovate it under its existing layout i'm wondering what the benefits are of this new layout and partial change of use in this planning permission well, principally, that it, it is going to bring it back into reuse. At the moment, it's vacant. Thank you. Look, I'm just looking for something in planning terms. I think I think we've asked three times. Yeah, all right. Probably move, probably move on at that point. Councillor Webb. Thank you, Chair. Um, as a... As a as a planning consultant, um, I think my, my concern really is around if this was to be approved and there was a, a, a series of flats and, and, and private residents living in those flats, um, could, you, could you highlight the effect on the amenities to those potential residents of a pub suddenly springing up underneath them? Um, what effect would it have on their, their amenities? Well, it, 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 it's not uncommon to have residential properties above um, uh, public houses and and th that's why acoustic consultants have, have, have put forward a robust report and it's been assessed by the environmental health officers 
and conditions would be attached to the planning permission such that residential amenity would not be harmed. So you're trying to suggest there will be absolutely no harm to to residents' amenities from, um, you know, someone's 18th birthday party going on below the floorboards? Well, that's, that's why we've got to, to uh, incorporate the acoustic measures set out in the acoustic report and, and stipulated in the planning conditions. They will be implemented. Thank you. I'm very much led, like you, Councillor, uh, with... with uh, with advice from professional environmental consultants, noise consultants, and, and the council is advised through their professional officers. Okay. Councillor Daubling. Thank you, Chair. Thank you. Um, can I ask you, Mr. Irving, um, when did your, um, when did the pub's current owners, uh, when did they buy the pub and how long did they run it as a pub? Can you tell us that? Uh, no, I can't. I think it was acquired in 2017, but I, I, I haven't got the exact date. Was it was it open at that time, Mr. Irving? Uh, I, I'm past. I don't know the exact answer to that. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Uh, and back to Councillor Crawshaw. Yeah, thanks, Chair. Uh, uh, apologies. I just wanted to um, just pick up one last point, and it's sort of partly building on some of what Councillor Melly was saying. Um, because obviously, Mr. Irving, you, you're encouraging us to look at the report and, and be dispassionate and, and all of those sort of things, which is you know part of our job to do. Um, page 13, Indeed. paragraph 5.8 um, of the report. Um, I just wondered if you could comment on that. It, it says, I'll read it to you, that the provision of three flats where one exists in an accessible location is beneficial. However, it is not considered that the modest gains in housing supply would outweigh any significant loss of valued community facilities that can serve the existing local population. So can you just, I've just, can you point me to the paragraph again, Councillor? Uh, it's paragraph 5.8 on page 13 of the report. Right, I've got that yet. I just wondered if you could you could give us any any comment on that because it it seems to be the nub of the issue in a way. Um, well, just looking at that, I mean, we would we would suggest that the provision of three flats, you know, we are still maintaining um, a function room, we are still uh, uh, maintaining the beer garden, we are still looking to maintain the, the public house. So I don't think that. Um, it does compromise what we're looking to achieve. Okay, so, so in your view, um, there would be no significant loss of valued community facilities. Is that essentially what you're saying? Yes, because yeah. uh, this application delivers the, 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 the public house and the, the, the function room and the beer garden. Okay, thank you. Thank you. I've got a couple more questions then, so Councillor uh, Perrett. Thank you, Chair. Um, I just wanted to ask whether any consideration was given to providing manager accommodation on site. So rather than having three flats that were then available to um, private tenants, whether or not, rather than having it as a lockup pub, which, um, you know, the inspector, um, I think the paragraph you pointed out, you know, it was made clear to the inspector that manager accommodation was essential. And I think some of the speakers earlier have really touched on why um, that can help mitigate some of the issues that the local residents might experience. So can you just let me know whether or not that was ever part of the consideration, whether one of the flats could potentially house a manager for the pub? No, it, has, it hasn't been part of the consideration. We, we, we have taken into account what the inspector said, and we, we, we believe that the, the public house uh, would, would be viable without the manager's accommodation. Thank you. And Councillor Craigfield, Leslie. Um, thank you. My question was very similar to Councillor Perrett's, I suppose, just as a follow up. Um, are you aware if your client um, does it run all its pubs without manager accommodation or why, why does it go for that model when we've heard? you know that that two experts at least who in running pubs and working in the, in the pub area who believe the management accommodation is absolutely critical how do, does your client actually run successful pubs without well, uh, that uh, uh, again councillor i i would just um uh, state that obviously you're going to be determining this application on on uh, that's before you and and we've based it very much on on 
the inspector's decision, having gone through the, the, the hearing um, um, and, and looking at what the inspector has said, and in his view that the, the public house, a smaller public house without the manager's accommodation, would be viable. Thank you. I can't see any further questions at that point, so thank you for your time this evening, and um, you'll be able to continue watching uh, on the Council's YouTube channel. So thank you for your time. Indeed. Thank you, Chair. Okay, so we move back then. So, any further questions to officers? I'm just. Um, I'll just point out, obviously, this has already been quite a lengthy agenda item, so we can try and keep it relatively on topic. Uh, Councillor Milley? Uh, sorry, Chair, I think Councillor Parrott had a hand up before mine. No? All right. Um, I was just wondering, I've just been rereading the conditions, and I can't see any about parking apart from um, electric vehicle charging. Is there a condition in there that I'm just struggling spot when I'm skim reading about um, the parking spaces being reserved for residents of the flats? Um, the, the, the parking would be for the flats and there'd be the three spaces. Um, yeah, so in condition 10 would relate to the parking storage access and manoeuvrage shown on the parking service areas. Uh, the parking storage access and manoeuvring areas shown on the parking and service areas to serve the flats and public house shall be laid out in, accor in accordance with the approved plans. So is it part of the plans? Is it clear in those plans that the parking is... The, yeah, there's three car and, parking spaces shown on the plans, yes. But, and, and in those plans, they're shown as being specifically for the flats? Um, I'm not sure if they're related to the flats, but that would be the assumption that they would be for the flats. But I guess if, if the, the pub decided to use them, I don't know if that would be a, a significant issue in terms of the acceptability of the scheme. But yes, it would be, it'd be expected they would be for the flats. They certainly wouldn't expect them to be for customers of the pub. Or staff of the pub. Yeah, they are marked on the... Uh... On the submitted uh, site plan that I showed members before, they're marked uh, as uh, flat one, flat two, and flat three. Okay, thank you for that clarification. Thank you. Uh, Councillor Perrett. Thanks, Chair. Um, I just wanted to return to one of the ideas raised by um, Councillor Croshaw around a deed of easement. So, conditioning for things like that. I know we've managed it before but um what would the process be if we wanted to look into that because obviously we don't have the um developer themselves there to have, have agreed to it tonight so it would involve some sort of negotiation with them after this um hearing's taken place um yes it would um i i think you would have to defer the application if that was what you were looking at uh we'd also need to speak to um the lawyers because obviously the the land is in the control of one applicant it's not like the uh this the situation on um uh on the crescent where the applicant the application um was adjacent to the uh, affected land so we'd have to look at that in terms of the legalities of uh, how to set such a thing up okay thank you uh councillor webb Thank you, Chair. Um, in terms of the conditions, we, we've spoken quite heavily about the fact that um, uh, these flats would be made and then uh, there would be some marketing done to try and sell the pub bit and make that work. Has there been anything, is there anything in there or should we put anything in there about um, if, you know, we couldn't find someone to buy it as a pub is it worth putting something as a fallback um and other community uh, venues have been looked at as well so i know that several speakers spoke about the fact that it might you know it would be great as a pub but it also could be lots of other different bits and pieces is anything gone in there about any other community aspects other than the pub that'd be outside the scope of this application this application is for three flats and the retained public house. Um, public houses are protected in terms of their use through the, uh, through the planning acts. Uh, so another community use may well require 
planning permission in its own right. So members members couldn't grant permission for more than is being applied for, um, for example. So uh, they would that would have to be dealt with um, through a new application um, at the time if if they were unsuccessful. You could put informatives on, uh, but uh, I don't think we could go any further than that. Well, something for later. I certainly think that informatives um, would be important at that stage um, to look at all community aspects. But yes, I, I take your point, Gareth. Uh, Councillor Crawshaw. Thanks, Chair. Um, page 15, paragraph 5.18 uh, says it's considered that issues relating to the loss of community facilities is the key consideration in assessing this proposal. Uh, and then I'm just relating that to page 23 and 5.44, um, policy D8, which we discussed earlier around the non-designated heritage assets and uh, community significance and, and what have you. I think one of the things that's, that's tricky for us in this application is that obviously we've got to give regard to, to planning law and we've heard um, the agent for the applicant say that they think that the pub is viable in its form that it's in and we've heard somebody who is actually a publican um, saying that they don't think it's at all viable um, and so I guess from our point of view we on the one hand whether or not it is or isn't a pub that's viable is you know we've got to sort of balance whether, how much that's a planning can issue or, or consideration um, but this issue around protecting community facilities and, and this policy D8 I'm just wondering whether that would be strong enough grounds if people felt that the pub wasn't sufficiently viable um, for the uh, for, you know for a refusal if that was what what the committee was minded to do because it seems to me that we could probably make an argument that, that says mm -hmm. that it, it would harm the community significance and given that this designation postdates the inspector's um, report then that's presumably new and material different to anything that may have been considered at the appeal in 2018 2019 am, am i um, barking up a wrong tree here or is this, is that looking in, in, in my view that the inspectors here in a year or so ago that, that looked at the assessment of whether there's a loss of community provision and the inspector from his decision seemed to come to the judgment that it was a loss of the, the function space and the beer garden of concern. So I think that issue has been addressed. So in terms of the heritage asset, I think the new issue that would come in would be whether the actual visual implications would have an impact that would be harmful and whether we should put greater weight on them now that it's a heritage, non-designated heritage asset rather than the community issues. Because I think the debate of whether the, the community facilities would be lost or not was really part of the previous consideration if you know what I mean, but the new issues are probably more the visual ones because I, the community I, issue was considered previously at the hearing. I do, I do understand that. I, I guess that where I, what I was thinking as I was listening to everybody speaking was that obviously a planning inspector is a, is a specialist in planning law and a publican with 10 years experience or more is a specialist in the viability of pubs. Yeah. And so, you know, if we're applying the weight of one or the other, I, I, you know, in terms of the legislation, yeah. I understand yeah. the weight that you need to play play to a, a, a planning inspector. But with the, you know, all due respect to planning inspectors, they don't run pubs. No, and no. So it's just kind of trying to yeah, I think understand it's the, yeah. that part of it. I, I think it's the new evidence issue that when we're at the hearing, Paul Crossman, who spoke previously, you, you know, runs who owns the volunteer and several other pubs in the city, and he's, he's regenerated them. He spoke and, and said a similar argument, and I I don't disagree with him. What he says about you know that the pub's obviously more viable if it's got the living accommodation and more external space and so forth but the inspector came to a different conclusion and i don't think while well, the issue is has any new information come to light since that inspector's hearing you know a year and a half ago really or are we just repeating the same arguments that, that have gone over previously in terms of the you know the viability and the community aspects thank you thank you Councillor Melly. Um, thank you, Chair. Is it all right if I change the subject a little bit? Um, just to look at a different aspect of the plans um, of the roof lights and the dormer. Um, in your report, you've said that they're acceptable and wouldn't do harm. Um, I'm just wondering if you could tell us a bit more about that, please, because usually um, if there's um, 
yeah, a, a, a building with six historical significance. We're told that that sort of thing um, would do harm to the architect architectural heritage or the character of the building if it can be seen from the street. So I'm just wondering why that isn't the case in this application. Yes, I, th I think it's it's the degree of harm. I think if roof lights are conservation type, and, and generally there's not a massive amount of glazing, I think a vertical glazing bar would help break that up. It doesn't create such a deadening effect. The roof lights are fairly well ordered. There's three on the main elevation, two on the rear. Inspect in respect to the dorm, as long as that's detailed correctly, reflects the other dormers. When you look at it in terms of the the elevation, it lines up with the other openings. Doesn't look particularly incoherent. So, in my view, that there is a degree of harm, but looking at it, it's not a listed building, it's not a conservation area. I, I don't think the degree of harm is probably justifies refusal based on it being a non-designated heritage asset rather than say a you know, grade two or grade one listed building. I, I don't, I, my view is that it's it would still be an attractive building, a substantial building, and probably in terms of its heritage, its, it's function as a pub is probably most important to that community and how it, how it works. I think that would be the, the worst impact. I think the actual, the, what I see is relatively minor changes. I, I don't think they're so harmful to justify refusal, but that is my own judgment. And the um, we did reconsult the, well, consulted the conservation officer in the light of the heritage, non-designated heritage assessment. He came to a similar view that the, the level of harm was relatively low. Thank you. Uh, Councillor Crackhill. Uh, thank you, Chair. Yes, I was trying to follow up on the um, previous conversation um, about the inspector's decision and how much we are required to um, give weight or to agree with that. Um, and you've got something in the paper at paragraph 5.24, um, it's quite a long paragraph, on page 17, um, it says the issue of whether it is possible to disregard the statements made in the inspector's decision and refuse the application on the grounds of the loss of the manager's accommodation and other concerns not opposed by the planning inspector. Um, it's being considered by the legal, council's legal department. It's advised regard should be had to the importance of consistency in decision making. And... Um, Oh dear, if it decides, and the committee should ask itself if it decides this application in a certain way, is it agreeing or disagreeing with some critical aspect of the decision in the previous appeal? Where there is disagreement, then adequate reasons should be given to explain departure from it. So it seems to me, I mean, one of the speakers from the law department um, mentioned this, it seems to me our consistency in decision making could be that we believe that we need to protect community facilities and that this proposal will not protect community facilities and our grounds for disagreement, there seem to be a number of possible ones. Councillor Crawshaw already referred to policy D8, which I think if I followed that is that now has more weight, does it, since the inspector made that ruling. Um, there's also, I think, a number of us started out with this question about there's no commitment to providing a kitchen, which may seem like a small detail, but actually, you know, how many pubs nowadays are viable community assets without actually providing food as well as drink as part of their offer? Um, I think that seems to me to just demonstrate that this is, sorry, I was, this is supposed to be a question still, is it? Um, yeah, so 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 I'm, I'll, I won't say that now, but yeah, how many can be viable without a kitchen? Um, and then there's just our own assessment of whether we believe that what's being suggested is actually viable in, in the context of all the speakers that we heard. So so I'm just really, I suppose, asking that sort of thing is is a basis for refusal, surely? Um, I don't know. I don't, I don't think we can. You know, if you want, you wish to move refusal and debate refusal. Um, then that's that's for obviously for you to do in the debate. Uh, the the report sets out why uh, why officers feel that um, uh, the application is um, is acceptable on its merits at the moment and takes into account what the inspector said. You got disregard. Uh, maybe disregard is the wrong word using in the context of five point two four. It's clearly a material consideration. The issue is how much weight members 
give to the inspectors' reports and conclusions in their assessment of the in their assessment of the scheme. And it it sets out quite clearly, I think, what um, what members need to consider. You don't have to follow what, uh, as it quite clearly says, you don't have to follow what the inspector says. It's a it's a different scheme, but the inspector does make. Um, uh, make assessments and make statements on on things that have been addressed in this report by the officer in coming to that conclusion. Um, I think that's uh, that's all we can say really. It's uh, it's for members to make that make that judgment if they feel if they feel different and they have uh, they feel they have sufficient planning grounds to oppose that. Thank you. Um, I can't see any further questions at that point. Um, so I'm happy to move us into debate if, if nobody's got anything burning left. Um, I'll invite any proposals. Councillor Wardley. Oops, sorry. Um, hi. Um, yeah, just to I'm 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 really torn on this because um, I can't actually see any planning grounds that we can refuse it on but I used to run a pub for two years and the noise was atrocious I know that I wouldn't have had insulation but when we had karaoke it was dreadful we couldn't hear the tv or anything so I'm I'm feel very sorry for these people if we were to approve it because crikey um and I also think that would probably kill the pub because you know they, they've said that they might use their own PA systems. So we've got a problem there. So um, I don't know how they're going to keep the noise down. And that's a real problem for me. Sorry. Thank you. Okay. Uh, Councillor Dorney, I think, is next. Thank, thank you very much, Chair. Thank you. Um, I think the way that this pub is being carved up um, into a mixture of residential and existing pub uh, is going to sit uncomfortably together. Um, I think what we would be left with would be um, something that was neither one thing nor the other. Um, you have, uh, you're losing enough of the um, important parts of a modern pub, a kitchen has not been promised. Um, there's going to be a 20% reduction uh, by the insertion of a staircase into the, the uh, function room. Um, and some of the many potential community assets which um, I can see working well, uh, the, the youth um, facility, um, the number of different groups who might use the, the rooms like um, the food bank, etc. in the, the pub, will begin to be neither space which um, the, will be taken up by the residential combination. Um, I think it uh, it has to have uh, enough of the pub retained to make it viable, and I don't think it is. Uh, I, I think it's going to be something. I, I'm not convinced that the acoustic um, test would be sufficient. Pubs can be noisy, lively places as they have to be to to make a living. Um, so I should be voting against this application uh, on the grounds that um, it doesn't hang well together. And I can see that in eventually we'd have sufficient problems with noise uh, for the, um, the pub to close and be converted into residential accommodation, which I am unhappy with. Is that a proposal, yeah. Councillor Dogman? Yes, I propose refusal. Thank you. Anybody like to second that? Um, yes, please. I'd second that. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. So we've got a few speakers. Um, obviously, we're going to have to articulate quite clearly what those reasons for refusal are. Um, but I'd let these come to cross also. Thanks, Chair. Um, I, I, given that it's been moved and, and seconded to, to um, refuse, I think there are quite clear grounds that we can cite. Um, my view would be that paragraph 92C, which is referenced on, uh, at, sorry, paragraph 92C of the NPPF, which is referenced at uh, paragraph 5.16 of the report on page 15, states that decisions should guard against the unnecessary loss of valued facilities and services. And I think the key word there is the unnecessary loss. 
And I think that we've heard from uh, somebody who is an expert in uh, running pubs and we've heard from uh, Councillor Wardby as well, who uh, I think we can count you as an expert in running pubs perhaps as well. Um, but the, there clearly are concerns around the future viability of uh, the pub as is proposed in this development um, and with all due respect to the planning inspector they're not somebody who's an expert in, in running pubs so I think that that is uh, a fairly solid grounds but I think if we wanted to then sort of build on that um, actually um, local plan policy d1 um, which is referenced in paragraph 5.3 of the report at page 12 states that development proposals that fail to make a positive contribution to the city or cause damage to the character and quality of an area or the amenity of neighbors will be refused and I think that that gives us a supplementary grounds for refusal and I also think that um, policy D8, which we've discussed a couple of times around the non-designated uh, non heritage asset, um, there's, there's grounds in there as well if we're talking about building weight to a refusal. Um, I think that we might struggle with that one on its own, but I think that in conjunction with policy D1 and the uh, relevant paragraph of the MPPF, I think that gives us um, fairly significant grounds to be able to say that we are uncomfortable that the pub as proposed will remain viable um, and just as a as an anecdote um, I think that I was on the planning committee uh, when the Falcon Tap came forward and it's not the same uh, development but it's a similar sort of thing where we were assured that the uh, change to the upstairs rooms uh, into residential accommodation and building out the back with residential would have no impact on the viability of the pub and within weeks of our planning committee hearing the pub was closed down it hasn't reopened and actually my understanding is that it currently cannot be operated as a pub because of the way that the site has been developed so I think that we are clearly guarding against the unnecessary loss of facilities and I think that that in itself is strong grounds with the backup of policy d1 and d8 also not having been met if we really wanted to, we could also chuck in policy HW1, which is about predicting existing facilities. But I think we need to be careful not to over-egg it. So my view would be on those three grounds. Thank you. So I'll go back to Councillor Dorgan and Councillor Warby. I'm going to assume you're happy with those three grounds. And see nods. Um, I'll go then to Councillor Webb. Yes, thank you. And I'd fully support those those grounds for refusal. Uh, I think on um, you know in paragraph five point eight, uh, it's not considered that the modest gains in housing supply would outweigh any significant loss of valued community facilities that can be served uh, can serve the existing local population. And I think um, the the key one for me is particularly paragraph 92c from the MPPF. Um, and I think that the most important bit there is uh, guard against, you know, we have to make decisions which guard against harm. And I, I honestly, from everything I've heard tonight, um, I, I've not seen that actually what we would result in, it would result in is, is a viable pub um, and a pub that would work. Um, and I, I genuinely think that that would then harm the local area, which then, of course, leads us back to the point of a significant loss of valued community facility. So um, that, for me, is, is the major issue. So, uh, yeah, I will be voting for refusal. Thank you. Um, two more people with their hands up. So, Councillor Galvin. <clears throat> Chairman, thank you. I suspect that uh, I should be like the guy in the rapids swimming against the tide. I'm quite concerned about the whole ethos that says that a guy, and, and I've no axe to grind, I, I've not uh, know much about pub running, but the whole ethos that a guy has to put his money into a building and then provide community facility. In my day, pubs were a community facility. There's not always about it. But the world has changed. And it's changed dramatically, certainly in this last 12 months. Uh, and I am unhappy and uneasy about the demands being made on the private developer. I don't know who it is. 
I don't know anything about them and I've no axe to grind with them whatsoever. But I am extremely disturbed about the attitude that we want you to provide us with this facility, with that facility for the benefit of the community. And I'm sorry, I, 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 can't, I can't agree with that. If the authority went and bought the, the pub and, and did it, then fine. If there were sufficient funds in place to buy it, fine. But at the end of the day, uh, I, I, I'm completely against it. And so, and a lot of what we've heard about a community facility and whether the scouts could use it or the cubs could use it or the food bank could use it, that's totally, um, I can't think of the word. It, 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 it's, it's, not, it's not on. And, and it really, we're looking at where it is now. And, and I've, I'm certainly not qualified in any shape or form to decide whether it's, whether the pub as it's proposed will be viable or whether it won't be viable. Uh, and I would go back to my original question to these, one of these people. And I got, in the end, I decided not to bother. Why did it close the first time? Okay, it's easy to blame the companies that weren't pub and they were charging top price, top back, and so on and so forth. The reason it didn't work is because the community didn't support it. And I suspect uh, whatever you do with this building, uh, if you want to keep it as a pub, would probably be, I probably won't, but God willing, many of you will be, uh, in three or four years' time, it could well be back in the same situation. So I cannot, I cannot support refusal. Uh, but as I said, I suspect I'm in the majority of one. Uh, I've got Councillor Fisher, and then I think we can move to the vote. Thank you. Um, I looked at this application with considerable interest. Uh, my view is that there is an under provision of pubs in the Lehman Road area. I mean, if you look, there's only one that's actually functioning. Um, Mr. One of the public speakers reminded me there used to be another one on Lehman Road called The Junction. I should remember it. My Sunday's 19th birthday party in there, and that has closed. So we have effectively one functioning pub for what I think is about a population of about 12, 1,300 people, which seems low to me. Um, now, I have great admiration of planning inspectors, but I'm not entirely convinced that they are experts in pub viability. I was a member of a small consortium 20 years ago that tried to buy a country pub in East Yorkshire. And we did a viability study, and the killer was the lack of manager's accommodation. We could, hadn't got room to put a manager's accommodation in there. And it, as a result of that, we'd have had to pay the manager a substantially higher salary, which killed the viability of the pub. And I can see the same situation happening here. The remaining pub will not be viable, may not be viable, due to the uh, lack of managers' accommodation. Uh, and consequently, I, I am concerned that selling off the three flats or renting them off in some way will affect the viability of the pub and it will be, there will be no possibility of it reopening. So on that basis, I'm going to vote for refusal. Thank you. Uh, and then finally, Councillor Cragfield. And then we are moving to the vote. Thank you. I just thought I put in my two pennies, but I'll keep it brief. Um, I just wanted to say that um, I do think we have an overriding um, obligation and requirement to protect community assets um, in the NPPF in our own draft local plan. Um, and I think that's what we should do. I think it's entirely clear to me that this, this is the Trojan horse sort of approach that some speakers referred to um, that will um, is intended to damage the viability um, of what remains um, as, as an ongoing um, pub and, and to undermine the future provision, therefore, in that, through that process of what I think could be a fantastic community asset. And that could be, well, be as a pub, but as a pub plus, um, like the Golden Ball is, for example. There are loads of examples. So I think um, we should definitely refuse this application. So I think we have reached the point now where we can put this to the vote. I guess, Gareth, if we could just have a quick sort of um, rundown and explanation of the three reasons that have been articulated by. Yeah, I, I think I've um, picked those up. Um, I'm pulling on some of the uh, wording from the uh, from the refusal of the 2016 um, 
uh, this um, application. Um, so uh, what I've what I've written down in, is that uh, the change of use of a large part of the internal and external area of the building stroke site from public house to three flats would result in the loss of a uh, significant part of a valued and important social recreational community facility and undermine the significance of a non-designated heritage asset and would result in the remaining public house uh, being an unviable facility. Um, and this would be contra contrary to paragraph 92 of the MPPF uh, policy D1, policy D7 of the local plan. Um, one thing I would say, um, Councillor Crawshaw uh, didn't uh, specifically um, excluded HW1 as a policy reference. Um, my view is that HW1 is quite a key policy when considering this type of uh, this type of use uh, and this type of change of use, I would um, I would suggest that, that it's that it's that it, it forms part of the refusal reason. But obviously, that's members' decision. Yeah, I'm, I'm sure that would be okay. Is it D eight rather than D seven? It's D seven. Uh, does it say D eight in the report? The local plan policy on his, in on non designated heritage assets is D seven. Okay. Apologies for any, uh, yeah. Apologies for any um, confusion there. D eight is uh, historic parks and gardens. That's definitely not relevant. Okay, was that your question, Council Crawshaw? It, it was that, and also just on the the policy HW one. The reason I was suggesting to uh, omit it was because I think it said in the report that uh, the, the MPPF paragraph ninety two underpinned HW1 and carried more weight. Um, so uh, if you're suggesting it, the HW1 would be useful to go in, there's no, I had no reason to exclude it other than not wanting to over-egg it, as I said. So um, We certainly used it in the previous refusal. Uh, we referred to HW1 yeah. um, in yeah. the previous refusal reason. And it, and it does, uh, you know, it, it does talk about uh, specifically about um, um public houses um i think in its uh, in the addendum that we sent uh, to the uh, to the inspector yeah. I, th I think it would be advisable to take to, to to do that if that's your advice that would be my view that's my advice and councillor melly thanks chair um yeah i was just wondering if we say in the refusal that um the it wouldn't be viable as a pub. Do we need to provide any justification for that of why it's not viable? Or can we just leave it at that? Um, it, it's, if it gets to the position of uh, an appeal, then that's certainly going to be something that, uh, something that will, will be discussed and we'll have to, um, we'll have to consider and, uh, and, 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 um, and support that decision. I mean, in in terms of um, in terms of bolstering the uh, the refusal reason, you, you could uh, include text which refers to um, the lack of staff accommodation, um, the um, the reduction in the in the the size of the function room. Um, I'm not. Uh, members also mentioned the the, the kitchen. Um, I'm not sure about that because the uh, again, it's, it's it's members' refusal reason. Uh, there is a kitchen. I, I believe that um, that the kitchen is uh, as an alternative is shown on is shown on the drawings. Um, I think my glasses are strong enough to see this. Um, yeah, I think it says pool room or kitchen. Uh, so, you know, you know, that's that's kind of hedging the plans to go one way or another. Um, I, I've been I, your hands on this one, really. Yeah, I, 
oh, maybe this is a matter for the committee to discuss. I, in my view, the inclusion of a kitchen might mean that the noise conditions are difficult to meet because of things like extractor fans, which are noisy. And, and you know, often external to the building, so can't be solved with internal insulation and that sort of thing. Hi. Well, I, I don't think there's a... I, I, I think that uh, I, I would... There are plenty of situations with residential accommodation above restaurants, uh, above pubs. I, I don't think there is inherently uh, a problem with having uh, having residential accommodation in, in close proximity to uh, to kitchen facilities. Um, uh, it, it's it's not as if it's an unknown for people who move into these uh, uh, to people who, who may move into the premises. Um, I, I don't think we would. I don't think we would. I think it'd be difficult to to argue that case. Uh, yeah. yeah, I was just going to say on the kitchen. I don't think it's a clincher on its own, but I just think it adds weight to our assessment of of the lack of of viability. And also, there's the element that the applicants have agreed to some condition to um, restore the other rooms, but that, you know, they, but not to do the kitchen. So again, that's just an indication to me of the, um, uh, yeah, you've got, and, and, and there has to be a choice between keeping a pool room, which is a community facility or having a kitchen in what remains. So, you know, it's not a big deal. I think it's just part of a, of a adding weight really. That's an, I guess we don't want to get too hung up on this one. No, sure. But I, I was just going to say that if, if we do want to put a few reasons of our justification of why we feel that the pub wouldn't be viable, I, I would suggest adding parking as well, of not having a single parking space for any staff or customers is the sort of thing that maybe would mean that it struggles to get a licence or struggles to attract customers and that sort of thing. I'm not sure it has public parking at the moment. I'd advise against okay. in an inner area requiring that um certainly because it's an existing pub to require that um that that it, it's being touted as a you know a local community facility uh it's not like a, a a village pub which which is going to survive on people traveling to it uh i think we would have difficulty um uh defending um defending a, a, a lack of parking issue all right that's fine okay thank you um, so can I take it then that the first three reasons that Gareth articulated then are the, the ones the committee is happy to, to see in the refusal? I can see a few nods. Can I double check that is the three? I'm not sure. I think the first key it's the is loss of the, the It's the loss of the, the, um, uh, the loss of the significant part of the uh, of the pub. Um, the uh, lack of viability of the remaining section for the because of the loss of those those three aspects, and then undermining the significance of the non-designated heritage asset. Is that those were the three elements? That's Was there an element about? Yeah, I, I think that's right. The only, the only other thing, and I, and I think we're getting into semantics a little bit here, and, and I'm conscious of the time. Um, the paragraph 92 which says we should guard against the unnecessary loss and, and I, I think it's that wording isn't it is, is guarding against the unnecessary loss of, of the facilities yeah um, i can put and, the and, word unnecessary in yeah, there i think I, I think that's quite important because i think that the other elements yeah. what we're saying is that the the provision of three dwellings doesn't outweigh that doesn't outweigh the harm of that um and you know if we if we and needing to at any point justify the viability aspect of it then obviously that's for the the people that we've heard today with their expertise telling us about the the their concerns around the viability but i think what we're talking about is that we we feel that we need to guard against that unnecessary loss yeah the word just just looking at the previous refusal reason on the previous scheme it does it does have the word unnecessary in there thank you i think then we've reached the point of being able to move to the vote. So Louise, if you're in the background and able to conduct the vote, I'll just ask firstly for members just to sort of visually indicate that you've, you've heard the whole debate being present throughout. Councillor Wardley. 
just to say that um, obviously my screen went off at the beginning of the um, questions, um, but I had my hearing, my earphones on, so I just want to say that I heard everything, just so the public know. Thank you. Okay, Louise, you're able now to. Yep, I can take the vote. That's fine. So, members, when your name is called, please state if you are for, against, or abstaining from the proposal to refuse the application. Um, so, I'll go through it alphabetical order. Councillor Craghill? For. Councillor Crawshaw? For. Councillor Daubeny? For. Councillor Fisher? For. Councillor Galvin? Against. Councillor Melly? For. Councillor Oral? For. Councillor Perrett? For. Councillor Wardby? For. Councillor Webb? For. And Chair, Councillor Hollier? For. Right, thank you. Right, well, that's carried then, Chair. You've um, um, with one against. Okay. Thank you. So that is refused. Um, if members could be back with us at half past seven, we've got a few people to, to bring in for the next item. Um, so if you're able to turn off your videos and we'll see you back then.
Right, thank you and welcome back everybody. Uh, if we can move on straight to item 3B, which is 52 Broadway Cafe. Yes, Gareth. <clears throat> um, thank you, Chair. I'm Gareth Arnold, Development Manager, City of York Council. This application is um, for the erection of a timber shelter to the front of the existing uh, coffee shop, so a cafe at uh, 52 Broadway in, uh, in Fishergate Ward. Um, it provides um, a shelter for up to 16 uh, seats. Um, I'll share my screen and show you the presentation. Just whilst you're doing that, I'll just note that Councillor Oral's left the meeting. You can see that. So the proposal is, uh, this is a street view. Uh, so this is the uh, uh, commercial premises, um, hairdressers, uh, there's a charity shop. Uh, the cafe is tucked behind in an extension to the side of this, uh, of the building that's shown, the proposed building. You so see there in, um, in plan and then in elevation and east elevation showing the existing boundary wall. This is a photo montage of the proposal. And then photographs. And then from the other, the other direction. Um, I should say we also have the planning officer for the application, Neil Massey, who's available for if uh, to answer any questions that members may have. Thank you. I'll just ask if there are any questions at this point. Um, so whilst I'm waiting, I'll just ask a couple of mine. The, on the virtual site visit we had um, a few days ago, um, there was a gazebo that, that doesn't have permission no, no, um, no, there is a there's a planning permission for I think one table and uh, and two chairs on the frontage. Uh, the the gazebo has been put out um, uh, during COVID times, but it's uh, it's not something that has uh, that has planning permission. And then just a second, one of the plans shows the, the loss of a bollard, which I guess is the the one just on the furthest left. Who actually owns the bollards? Do we know? Is it a council? Um, I, I don't know. I, I think they might have been put up by the individual shopkeepers as part of a sort of a local initiative. I wouldn't want to swear to that, but I, from speaking to people previously who lived there, I think they've arranged it themselves, but I'm not certain. It's not It's not highway land. It's not adopted highway. It's private land. So I think it's the local people, but I couldn't, I couldn't swear on that. Okay. Thank you. Um, Councillor Crackhill? Oops, sorry, slow to find my mute button. Um, yes, I'd just like to ask some questions. Um, I mean, I've got a number of questions, but I'll, I'll stick to one particular area. Um, obviously, um, I would, in, in respect of the reasons that, that, that have been given for, for recommending refusal, um, one is in relation to the width um, of pavement between um, the, the edge of the road and, and the, the corner of the building. There's a kind of pinch point, which I think is of some concern. And obviously, if that did prevent um, people with disabilities, wheelchair users, people with double buggies, etc., getting through there, then that, that would be a, a serious concern. But I just wanted to ask a few questions about the actual measurements that, that have been put forward in the paper. Um, the, the drawings seem to suggest that, that pinch point would be around 1.68, or is it 1.63? I'm not sure. 1.6 metres um, wide. 
Um, and I just wanted, I was just trying to get an idea of what that represents. So my first question is, is, is that width not sufficient for a wheelchair user or a mobility scooter or a double buggy to pass through? Um, I don't know if anyone from Highways is still available who'd like to answer that. I could answer, but it's probably more appropriate from someone high, from Highways if they're available. Hi there, it's Emma Leonard. I'm just trying to find my camera, although it's probably not necessary. It's Emma Leonard from, um, the, I'm the Highway Development Control Engineer. Um, in terms of manual for streets, we're looking at two metres minimum footwear widths for for things and um, as this is actually on on a bend into that um, area there um, and the fact that it's going to be used quite um, extensively it's a shopping precinct we'd expect to win possibly milling around of people and so so on in that area um, you know that's why I was suggesting on um, in my comments that um, that dimension should be increased Right, but it is wide enough for a wheelchair user or a double buggy or even a mobility scooter yeah, probably but to as, get through, isn't it? As as you would um as you'd imagine as the car is coming into that area, um it's quite possible that you know it will overhang the footway as it's turning into there potentially, you know, to put you know big delivery stuff. Um so yeah, I mean again for the two way element we would expect two metres minimum, but on, on that bend, um, it would be my recommendation that that would be increased um, furthermore. Okay, so the pavement outside my house, which is in a similar area, is 1.6 metres, actually. Does it have cars coming in through to it? Oh, it has crossovers. Um, so anyway, that okay, but but it is so 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 the wider width, the two point five to three meters, is actually to allow something like two mobility scooters to pass each other at the same time, isn't it? Essentially, yeah. That, so that's that sort of width, with it, with it, which is with it. not necessary because they could take turns, couldn't they? Um, what towards a, a shopping parade? Um, mm -hmm. We would we would expect more than what's been presented, I think. Okay, and just a final question related to that. Could you just confirm that um, the proposal um, leaves the um, what, what you referred to in the paper um, it, as the guided pedestrian shop access way, which is essentially a white line with pedestrian symbols that kind of sets out a pedestrian path all around the shopping centre. It leaves that intact all the way around from from the from the main road past the new structure and then along by the shops, it all stays intact. Sorry, I'm not sure of the question there. It's well, not... in the paper you described yeah. um, the um, guided pedestrian shop access way, mm -hmm. um, which is something that was put in a while ago, um, has a white line that designates an area for pedestrians to feel safe from cars mm -hmm. that still remains in place doesn't it along the side of the new structure yeah gareth could you just go back to that previous photograph that one that one yeah i mean as you're turning the corner through that the point from the the you know the the long footway that's coming up the road there you know the I believe that there is, you know, you know, sort of certain highway established rights to sort of get to the rest of the shops. You know, it's, you know, it's been allowed to pass and repass. So there's a sort of almost like a diagonal, you know, sort of area into that place is, you know, is, is used as part of the, of the forecourt for the whole shopping precinct, really. You can see the white line on that image, actually. That I'm talking about. Yeah, but yeah. my point is is more, you know, you know, getting to there and to the left hand side of that bollard. Okay. Thank and you. Sort of desire line, if you know, if so to speak. Okay. Okay, Councillor Wolfe. Thank you, Chair. Um, my question is really um, relating to Councillor Craghill's um, question, and it was about the mind about the um, doors at the back or the front, as you'd put it. Um, 
if they the applicant was mindful to change the doors so they don't open out on <laughs> to yeah so would that would that be acceptable then because that would give you your two as far as i'm aware that would give you around the two meter mark if you see what i mean for the wheelchairs and the scooters yeah i think with the doors um you know um difficulties with the fact that they open out onto a publicly used area um you know certainly from the highways act point of view um doors aren't allowed onto our you know to open out of or any gate uh, are not allowed to open out onto the highway um so as this is highway you know particularly you know highly used by you know people accessing the shops and so on um you know, the, the same principles would apply. I mean, yes, we, we, you'd gain that to me to say if it was a roller shutter. And I think yeah. in my comments, it, you know, it said well, we really need rid of the doors. If, um, but again, I would I'd still, you know, request wiggle room, so to speak, um, to get past that um, structure. So, so you're saying um, that if they did change them to roller doors, that you'd still be mindful to refuse the application no, um, what, 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 the, sorry. no what i'm saying is if they're, they're just roller doors and they're not you know they're not actually opening over um any anything um you know that's that's a better solution and possibly scale back the building a touch thank you thank you um i can't see any further questions at that point gas possibly able to bring the screen down And I think I've got Councillor Galvin. It's only a very simple question, but I don't quite understand. Page 55, 3.9. It says it's to be used as a garage. Uh, um, Neil, could you... Um... Could you answer that? I think it's in the yeah. application. Isn't it? Yes, the the applicant has, has said that it, you know, the intention would be or could be to use it as a garage in the evening. It's it said the dimensions of a basic garage six meters by okay. three meters. Fair enough. I just I thought it might have been a typo, but yeah, that's fine. Thank you, Councillor Crawshaw. Thanks, Chair. Um, I just wondered if we could clarify is. is um, an issue that's been raised by one of the objectors, page 56, um, uh, paragraph 4.3, the last bullet point says that the area of land where the building is proposed is not owned by the applicant and all owners of the premises on the parade have a legal right of unobstructed access across the land. Um, I wondered if there's any clarity to that. I, I, I understand from conversations previously that there is some ambiguity over the ownership of the land, but it's the unobstructed access particularly I was wondering about. Um, I'm, I'm not familiar with that. I've, I've seen details from the land registry, which indicates that the applicant owns the building and the land behind the building and that the swathe of land in front of the parade. No one knows who owns that, but I understand people have a right of access across it to their own property and so forth. That's as far as I know. And the applicant has changed the, the notice certificate on the plan application. Originally, they said they owned it. They owned all the land and then they changed it to say that to serve notice to state they, they don't know who owns the land. Thank you. Uh, Councillor Fisher. Thank you, Chair. Correct me if I'm wrong, that's not a planning issue, is it? Not typically, no. If, if no. it's not, not in normal sequences, no. No. Okay. Uh, Councillor Crecker. Thank you. Yes, sorry. I just wanted to follow up very quickly on the um, <laughs> the doors at the at the front. The um, the applicant. I think the paper says the applicant has changed them to bifold doors, which I'm kind of guessing still take up a little bit of space. But how how does that work in terms of your calculations of how much um, space? That, that was what was shown on the, the the amended plan. Was what you were shown on that presentation. Right, so that so by folding door still uh, still projected out. Projects out a bit, so it's it's one point uh, six. As shown on those drawings, yeah. one point yeah. six is 6. still the measurement. Yeah. Okay, I just wanted to be clear. Thank you. Okay, Councillor Worthing. Um, yeah. Um, thanks, Chair. And sorry to overkill, but um, 
talking about this, the how it sends out. Um, yesterday at the site visit, we saw that there was a gazebo there. Um, and I, I'm sure, I'm not obviously an expert, but it seemed to be near enough the same length as the um, the building, the, 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 the timber building they're wanting to put on. So are wheelchairs and buggies um, able to go past at the moment? And is the structure, the gazebo, the same length? That was my questions. The, 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 the gazebo and, and outside seating beyond two seats wouldn't have permission. It'd be in breach of the planning permission for the actual cafe. So in terms of the gazebo, and well, the gazebo is possibly not development that needs permission if it's a temporary structure, but actually putting seats on the area beyond two, two seats, one table is in breach of the planning consent at the moment. But obviously there's been some pragmatic approach in terms of the COVID situation, so it's not normal times, but the gazebo and the seating outside there shouldn't be there anyway, really. Yes, yes, but it is there. So what my question is, is if the gazebo is the same length as the, the proposed timber building and are the um, buggies and scooters be able to get past, then there shouldn't be a problem if it's the same. Yeah. I was asking if it's the same yeah. length. I'm not, I'm not sure if it's exactly. We have had one or two objections from people who have expressed concerns that since the gazebos have been there, it's meant they've had to go onto the road. But I haven't been out there at different times to measure how far the gazebos come out. Thank you. Uh, Councillor Crawshaw. Yeah, just a, just a point of clarity, if I could. Thank you, Chair. Um, so it, it's just been mentioned, actually, that the, the current use um, with the gazebos is in breach of the existing planning condition. Um, and I can't see, but I may have missed it within the papers, any uh, application to vary or change that existing planning condition. Um, have I missed it? Or if I haven't, do, does that mean that that planning condition would still apply to this space that was covered by a, a new structure, that actually they still would only be allowed to have one table and two chairs out the front of the cafe? This would be a standalone planning permission they wouldn't need to um the, the local planning authority makes the decision to grant planning permission for an, an enlarged seating area they don't then need to vary the existing planning condition it's kind of um so we're not being asked to, to sorry this is just i know it's a, a bit of a, a technicality but I don't, are we being asked to provide a larger seating area or are we being asked to approve a structure being built uh, well, it's part and parcel of the same. They're, they're, they're it's all the same, same thing. thing. Yeah. Right. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. But just just to clarify, though, I mean, Gareth mentioned that it, the capacity of sixteen, it would have a capacity of sixteen, but they have mentioned that they'd be willing to condition that there's only 10, 10 seats within yeah. the structure. Yeah. I just wanted to be clear about exactly what we're we're being asked yeah. to approve on. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, and Councillor Crackhill. I, I was just going to say in response to Councillor Warby's question that. Um, I, I couldn't actually make the virtual site visit, so I just went and did myself a little site visit today. Um, and my impression is, my impression, obviously, it's just my calculations that the gazebo is perhaps just slightly longer than the structure because um, it's got like a banner or something in front of it as well, which wouldn't, wouldn't be there. Um, but it's quite similar and the, there does seem to be the space as, as measured, really more or less. Thank you. Councillor Fisher. Thank you. I went there and at the moment the gazebo does allow room for considerable amounts of room. The point is the gazebo does not have two doors sticking out the front of it. That's the difference. That is the subtle difference. And I, I, I actually sort of did a little measurement as to where the doors would come to and it would be very tight for people to get past in a wheelchair if the um, proposed structure with two opening doors was there. Thank you. Uh, I think we can probably, um, Councillor Crawshaw. Sorry, ap apologies, Chair. It's, it's just on this issue about, about these conditions that were previously in place then, because I, I think my reading of the planning history is that there was a small additional cafe that was given approval because there was going to be no additional um, sort of seating at the front. And then an a application came in to vary that for... A, you know single chair I think two two chairs and a table and it just seems to be a, an incremental increasing of of use of the front space are you able to give us any detail as to 
why it wasn't allowed to use the front space in the first instance because presumably if it was an acceptable use you know if we're, if we're to consider it an acceptable use now it would have been an acceptable use three years ago whenever the, the initial four years yeah. ago now the the application was a delegated decision. I say it must be three or four years ago, and it was at that time there was no single story structure between the hairdressers and the adjacent house. And I did have some concerns about filling that gap because a natural buffer between the commercial parade and the residential. But obviously, in, in making the decision, you're balancing the benefits to the community. And at that time, it was it was seen that a small cafe might be a benefit to the community. It was it was, it was almost seen as an addition to the to the um, hairdressers in the sense that people might have a cup of coffee and so forth before getting the haircut and and it, it, it felt that on a low key basis it would be acceptable but there were concerns that if if the actual permission included the the area to the front the red line included that and you had 10 or 15 seats out the front there that it's probably not an a, a fill in that gap but also putting those outdoor seats adjacent to joining gardens was too, too big a scale of development thank you and, and nothing else has changed in the intervening period on that? Not not on site. Nothing's changed on site, no. Thank you. Okay, thank you. I think we can move on then to our public speakers. Um, the first, sorry, Councillor Webb. Sorry, one last question. I'm coming back to the, the ownership of the land, and I understand someone's always said that it's not a planning concern that this person or this applicant potentially doesn't own the land but surely that's going to affect whether they can do something or not could i just get a, I don't that's know. there it's i guess it's a there's a there's an element of risk when you don't own the land that, that someone who does own the land or has access benefits of access rights is, is going to come along and say um, actually, you can't you can't do this. But that that's outside the that's outside the planning process. The granted planning permission doesn't override any um, private property rights that, that 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 may exist on 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 land. So as for 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 the purpose of the planning act, as long as they've gone through those legal hurdles of of advertising that they're putting in a planning application. Um, on land where they they that they, they, they don't own, then then that's as far as we really need to go in terms of in terms of ownership issues. Thank you. Okay, so I think we can move on then to our speakers. The first of which is uh, Mrs. Jane Morrison. Um, if you're with us, Mrs. Morrison. Hello. Good evening. Hi, we can hear you okay. Um, you may have heard earlier that you'll have three minutes to address the committee um, and if you're able to sort of hang on the line after you've spoken just in case there's any questions. Okay, um, thank you. Would you like to make a start in your own time, please? We supported the original application. However, the business already isn't what the owner explicitly declared when asking for our support, which was low-key use primarily targeting existing customers at the salon and hence little disruption, disturbance or inconvenience. The original and subsequent granted planning accounted for our amenity. We have tolerated breaches in planning permission, understanding and accounting for the pandemic. However, we object to and do not feel it reasonable to have this business expansion and shelter with its out of character, incongruous design, less than three metres from our front door. It would be an inescapable constant view for us. We have concerns that out of hours, the wooden structure has potential to become the focal point of antisocial behaviour. We are uncomfortable at the front of the house where there have been people sat on chairs outside. We feel the loss of privacy and feel overlooked. We hear the voices and conversations through the open windows and from people sat or congregating outside. Customers using the coffee shop cannot be likened to passers-by. Static multiple voices do create noise, and I contest the claim that the wooden structure would provide a good level of acoustic protection, as claimed in the DNA statement. Equally, I contest the claim in this same section that there would be no impact on the private rear garden of 54 Broadway. The coffee shop's function is easily audible. The road entrance to the shops directly outside our home and at the site of the proposed shelter can be very busy. There are cars approaching both ways, buses stopping, pedestrians and cyclists, and now the e-scooters. 
Accessing and leaving our drive can be a challenge, and the temporary gazebos made this worse. We have genuine concerns for safety when our view to the west is partially blocked, which the proposed shelter would do. Pedestrians from the east using the footpath, myself included, end up on the road because of the gazebos and people congregating. With cars swinging in, it feels unsafe. There is limited parking at the shops and there are often no spaces. The historical issue of poor parking outside our home obviously cannot be attributed solely to the coffee shop, but it has noticeably increased, particularly so with motorists blocking our drive to park, albeit temporarily to collect drinks and food. On more than one occasion, we've been unable to leave our drive and the motorist makes a cup holding gesture, a just five minutes sign and points towards next door. Polite requests have resulted in verbal abuse. Not every member of the local community used the coffee shop, but all of the community would have to bear the impact of this proposal. And some, this includes my family, more than others. Thank you. Thank you. And I'll just ask if the committee's got any questions. Um, I can't see any, so um, I'll thank you for your time this evening. Um, you're free to leave the meeting. You'll be able to, to continue watching on the Council's YouTube channel. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, next to speak then is Mrs. Teresa Byrne, who's uh, the owner of the coffee shop. If you can hear me. Mrs. Byrne, can you hear me? Good evening, councillors. Can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you. Um, yeah, and you'll have heard you've got three minutes to address the committee. So if you're able to, to make a start in your own time. Yeah, of course. My name is Theresa Byrne. I actually live at 52. Um, I can hear you. Can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you. Can you hear me? I think you might have the YouTube on in the background, which is causing you oh, a, yeah, a I, delay and an echo I, if you mute that. I actually did it. Oh, hi there. Sorry, I've just had to turn you down so I can actually speak. My name is Theresa Byrne. I live at number 52 Broadway. My husband has been in Paul for 50 years and I've been there for 30 years. Um, we live where we work, so we make sure that everything's nicely done. The reason you've got all the lines and the um, barriers and the posts is because I don't know if you remember Bagnara, but we were um, with them and we actually maintained everything and put all the posts up so the cars um, did not hit anybody as they were driving up. And um, Councillor Craghill is completely right. What she's saying is with the actual white lines which were put down by us, um, they won't impact on the build at all. And we have many a user of disabled people that come and go. There's a lot of twins in Fulford um, and the double buggies that come along, it does not impact them at all. We have found out through the um, pandemic, everybody walks to us. Um, you know, it's it's been a local hub of everyone. You know, when Prince Philip died, everybody was talking about it and everyone was passing through. It's it's just the community spirit of everything. Um, the, the, sorry, I'm not very good at talking. The requirement for a noise assessment is unreasonable. The area is busy with pedestrians and traffic and the cafe will only be open during normal business hours. Therefore, no adverse impact on 54 Broadway. The occupiers look out of their front window onto their four of four of their own car parked on the forecourt. The structure is only marginal higher than a two metre brick wall that could be built on the boundary as permanent development. It is accepted that the structure stands forward of the nominal building line, but this would not detract from the character of the area Rather, it would enhance the character of the area by introducing a feature of interest and novel design. It is not located within a conservation area. 
The doors on the front elevation can be kept closed or turned to just the left hand door can be open or we can have bifolds or a roller sh shutter door as suggested. Um, 30 seconds left. Comments are made about the design model is it will always be a question of contrasting taste. This is a wooden and glass structure designed to create an airy shelter space with as a Viking theme long haul. After all, this is where the 1066, the Battle of Fulford, um, was fought by Viking. It therefore celebrates our heritage and does not demeaning it. In terms of increased noise, I, like everyone else, cherish the peacefulness of our home life, but our premises would only be catering during the morning and afternoon. The design of the abutting wall is solid to absorb a good proportion of the sound, and I or any other member of my family will always be attending to monitor sound levels. After you're all, you're able to, to wrap up, please. Oh, sorry. Um, no alcohol is going to be served, and they are actually going to be adults, so it will be there for be, be only be background chatter of people. Thank on a, you. On a Sorry, I'm going to have to. Okay, no worries. Thank you anyway. Just hang on a second. Just got a couple of questions, Councillor Warby. Um, hello. So, um, thanks very much for speaking. Um, I just wondered if you would, um, if if we were um, in mindful to approve the, um, your your application, would you? Um, be acceptable to you to um, make the um, the frontage shorter um, and you, you've obviously said you'll change it to maybe a roller door um, yeah so could you could you come to terms with ha having like maybe I don't know a foot or two off of it so then Definitely. there would be you would um, I'm not yeah, saying that's absolutely. what's going to happen obviously but um, yeah so just so we can be mindful of that thank you very much absolutely thank you uh, Councillor Cracker. Thank you. Um, yes, I just wanted to ask you, um, some people, as you say, the design is a matter of, to some extent, of personal taste, isn't it? But there has been some concern expressed about the design. I'm, I'm personally not, don't mind either way, really. I think the community value is more important. But if, if, um, if, if the committee was minded to feel that the design was an issue would you be prepared to change that of course i would but i just thought doing a viking um theme would be great because you know that's what york is about and i thought it would just be lovely rather than just a normal building mm, thank you and, and i don't know just a second question that's that's all um i don't know if you if you could say a little bit more about why you know, why you want to do this, why you want to make this change as opposed to the current situation, what, what well, the reason it, is. I love working from home um, as, you know, I've had an illness, so I'm probably like everybody else in this pandemic. You want to stay local. Um, the reason I want to do it is because, you know, when I had my babies in Fulford, there was nowhere to go for a coffee. There was no hub. There was no community you know, and, you know, I suffer terrible with postnatal depression and we have a lot of people that come in and they meet up and everybody talks. There's people that are single, um, old and young. And I introduced them because when I started washing hair next door in the hairdressers, I used to make coffee and the ladies used to say it would be better with a piece of cake. And that's where the where the coffee shop came in. So when we opened up the coffee shop, I know quite a lot of people. So I was able to introduce, you know, that person to this person. And to be honest, it's been become fantastic in the last year. We've been amazing. Thank you. Thank you. Councillor Crawshaw. Thanks, Chair. Um, a, a couple of questions, if I may. Um, I just wondered if you could uh, tell us what your current opening hours are and how many days you're currently open. Yeah, at the moment, we were allowed to open from eight until six, Monday to Saturdays, um, but we only do eight until four, um, which suits everybody. 
And I know from that time, it's just, and you know, nice to shut down and make tea because we live there. You know, we're respectful of everybody in the street. So, you know, we don't open any bank holidays. We don't do Sundays. We don't do anything like that. We like peace and quiet as well as anybody else. Thank you. And then the other question, because it seems to me I, I can sort of understand the situation that, you, that you're in, in the sense of you've, you've demonstrated that you've got a, a business that's sort of flourishing and, and you, you know, you're looking to, to be able to provide more covers, as it were. Um, but obviously, there's been this creep in terms of the planning history, in terms of what you first applied for, and by the sounds of it, gave assurances that it was just this small thing, and then it's been just one extra table, and and then you know one little bit more. And I think what we have to balance as a planning committee is that on the one hand, you know, obviously we we really like to support local businesses and and want to see people do well, but on the other hand, it's the impact on on the neighbours as well. And I'm just a bit concerned about you know, what assurances were given, because I think both the planning officer and, and the neighbour has have said that when the first cafe was first opened, it was it was quite clear that it was just to be contained within that space and using the possibly some space at the rear. Was that yeah, always well, your understanding as well? Because it, it just seems like what we're now looking at is quite a different scenario. Well, this was 2018, I think they moved in. And at the time when I opened up, I opened up in the June and then I got cancer in the September. So to be honest, it was closed for a year. We opened it up and then we had to close it while I went through my treatment. So it, it, it might not have been clear because my when we opened it up again, um, you know, to be honest, it was like my daughter said, oh, come on, mum, let's do it. You're getting better now. And I was given the all clear. So we opened it up and then we just went from there. And then, you know, somebody said, can I come down with my twins and sit outside? And then it came from that. And then obviously it's gone from this to the pandemic. It's just been a roller coaster, to be honest. Um, and it's a different world we're living in now. You know, it's gone from being doing coffees to people like needing it every day. Sorry, yeah. Chair, may I just take a, a supplementary on that? Because because I I understand that and I, and I can completely get all that. Have you um because it sounds like you've demonstrated there's a need for this sort of a cafe in in the area, but have you explored different possibly more suitable premises in the area? Well, no, because I've had throat cancer. Like anybody else, I actually need to be near my family, and I wouldn't want to go. I work from home, um, like like you are doing now. You know, I'm working from home, I feel safe and secure, and I've got my family around me, which is nice. And um, I, and to be honest, if I'm not feeling very well, then my daughter takes over, um, which is good. But, um, you know, that's all I can say, really. Okay, thank you. Okay, thank you. Um, I can't see any further questions at that point. So thank you for your time this evening and, and similarly, You'll be able to sort of continue watching on the on the YouTube channel, but thank you. Okay, thank you ever so much. Have a good evening, everybody. If we could next go to Mrs. Rebecca Eccles, who's um, if you're able to hear me. Can you hear me? Hello, can good you? evening. Can you hear me? Yeah, we can hear you. Um, yeah, if you're able to start. We've got three minutes to, to address Thank you. Um, evening, councillors. appreciate your time um, on this. I'm um, obviously talking to you on behalf of uh, myself and my husband who have the Sadlin pub in Fulford um, around the corner from 52 Broadway. Teresa and her family have been nothing short of wonderful since we've moved in. And I am really disappointed in the council that you, given in that there's a hundred people that have applied and agreed and gone forward and spoken to Teresa and her family and to, to accept this, um, this extension, and yet you're still, you're determined to potentially re refuse it based on three people who have um, put in uh, objections to it. I, I feel very strongly about this. What they do for the local community is, is nothing short of wonderful. Supporting everybody is a community hub. We don't have 
that space here. Yes, we have the pub, but we don't have the space that we have at the um, the coffee shop that integral. We've got people who bring their, their, their small children. They, they come and sit. They have a chat. Exactly what Teresa said. It is a hub. Um, I'm disappointed as well that um, you mentioned about the size of it and the, the footpath. Has anybody... Um, who owns the, um, the bollards that have been put there? Who put those bollards there? Did the council put those bollards there to protect the path? Because nobody was concerned about that pathway until those bollards were put there by Teresa and her family outside of that shop to protect that path from the cars that come onto the drive. And again, um, the lady who lives next door, I think her name was Jane, the first speaker, complaining about the noise, the co-op and their deliveries, when they block the whole of the car park or the main street with their deliveries, that's far worse than any noise. The co-op that's open until 10 o'clock on night that has gangs of youths sitting outside multiple times has been complaints about gangs of youths sitting outside the co-op at the bus stop make far more noise than anybody is going to sit in a coffee shop and have a, um, a coffee al fresco, which is what obviously has been encouraged at the moment. Um, I don't understand why the, the potential for a refusal. Yes, again, like Teresa openly admitted, it might not be to everybody's taste, but don't refuse it just because of that. This community needs this. It needs a central place. It needs somewhere where people can meet. Teresa has introduced us to so many wonderful people who have helped us in our business, and we do exactly the same. We pass that information on to people. And I feel, I feel really upset that you're, you're potentially refusing it based on three people when over 100 people have accepted and supported this project. And I think I'm done in time. Thank you very much for listening to me. I appreciate that. And I'll take any questions if anybody's got any. Thank you. Uh, Councillor Crawshaw. Thanks, Chair. And, and thanks for coming to speak to us uh, this evening, Mr. Eccles. Um, I, I just I think it is important just to, to note that planning isn't a popularity contest. It, it, it's about applying... Um, legislation which sometimes is there to protect individuals even if there's a, a groundswell of support and so part of what we'll be doing this evening is is trying to balance everybody's different needs. Um, there was just one thing in, in what you said which slightly concerned me and it was something that was raised by um, uh, one of the other speakers as well. You, you said that there was gangs of youths hanging around uh, the co-op and I'm not familiar with the, with the location but one of the concerns, I think, was that this shelter might be um, used outside of the cafe's operating hours, might be a magnet for antisocial behaviour. And, and do you think that same gang of youths potentially could be attracted to, to this coffee, you know, the, this shelter? And, and why would they not be if, you know, what, what's, what's the reason why the you think reason, that might not happen? So the reason why these individuals won't sit there is because it's publicly owned, it's privately owned. And it's not cool to sit um, in a nice area. It's cool to sit at a bus stop and hang around and cause mischief outside of the court because they can and use all those new electric scooters and things. Um, they're not going to sit there because it's got CC. I mean, I know the court's got CCTV, but, you know, it, doesn't, it does cover the bus stop, I believe. But it's privately owned. Teresa and Steve live upstairs. They live at the back. They can hear what's going on. They know what's going on. And most of the parents of those youths probably do actually use the coffee shop themselves and probably some of those youths do as well. So I don't think that that would be a problem. That's like saying outside of my pub, if I had seating outside there, they would automatically sit there. They don't sit outside of my pub. They don't sit out of any of the other pubs that have got seating outside. Why would they congregate and sit there? They sit at a bus stop because it's convenient for them to go into the supermarket and get whatever they want and congregate there. That's the reason why they do that. Thank you. In my opinion. Okay, thank you. Um, I can't see any further questions. So thank you for your time this evening. Um, you're free to leave us. Thank you. Good night. And then lastly, if we could move on to Gerald Ward. Good evening, councillors. Can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you. Um, if you're able to, to make a start of me three minutes. Yeah, sure. Mine's, mine's quite a short statement, actually, uh, purely from a, a commu uh, you know, a consumer's point of view. Because uh, so at, at the moment, um, with the exi existing facilities that are in place, we tend to struggle to get seatable access due to the number of people that are visiting with what the facilities are in place. 
Uh, most customers want to be able to sit in a comfortable environment to enjoy their per- purchase. However, um, you know, whether that's a coffee, a savoury or, or both. Um, personally, I believe it's paramount that this application is granted. Um, in the relatively short time period, this coffee shop has operated. It has become an important hub of the community. Uh, where a wide spectrum of people visit on a daily basis, you know, whether the young parents with children, a busy workman, or indeed the elderly. Um, you know, the, these, are, these are truly trying times at the moment, and I believe that it's essential that we have local businesses like this where within a local, um, where local people can meet and mingle and mix in, in a comfortable environment. Um, personally, the coffee shop creates a warm, homely feel, uh, yeah, at the same time, it would help if people can sit and work in relative privacy whilst then enjoying their purposes. And uh, that concludes my uh, my statement. Thank you. Uh, I'll just see if there's any questions, which I can't see at the moment. So thank you for your time this evening. Um... Thank you, councillors. Okay, then, if there are any further questions for, for officers at this point. Councillor Webb. Thank you. Um, Gareth, there was, uh, throughout the, the, the plethora of public speakers that we had the sort of for and against, there was various sort of almost, uh, I think it came up in, in one of Councillor Craggill's questions about the fact that... Um, and maybe Councillor Wardby's as well about, oh, it, it's too long or we need to change the doors or we need to change the design of it. And 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 the applicant seemed relatively amenable to, to most of those ideas. So so my question would be is when, for when we sort of move into debate, um, would that be a refuse the current application on, on the grounds that are outlined as is um, uh, and, and come back with a new plan or would it be defer and there's the, there would be um, a small enough number of changes that could be made uh, in deferral that would then make this an acceptable scheme? Um, where's the boundary, I guess? I think something like... Um something like amending the doors so that they are not outward opening or aren't um uh when they're retracted they don't open out out um, out of the confine of the building uh, that's probably something where members could impose a condition seeking um either either just putting that as a statement or requiring a, a plan to be submitted something like um saying the building should be um, 300, 600 millimetres shorter, um, I would say we would need to ask for an amended plan uh, that goes beyond what you could do by uh, through an amending condition. And then that's the choice of members, really, uh, whether it's delegated to officers uh, and if we receive something which matches what members have asked for, uh, that can be dealt with under delegate powers. Um, or whether you'd want to see it coming back to members or a halfway house where we can involve chair and vice chair. Thank you. Are there any further questions or are we happy to move into debate? Councillor Crackle. Um, really, prior to sort of commenting more broadly in terms of debate just following up from councillor webb's comments i just i would like to kind of hear from other members of the committee if there are other you know well i suppose i would <laughs> i might like to put deferral or i might like to put delegation on the t- i'd like to hear what other concerns people have or has councillor webb covered the main concerns that people might have, the doors, the length of the building. I don't know if people are concerned about the design, but it does seem to me there is a solution here. Um, we just need to sort of clarify how how the committee sees it. Could, you know, could we go for approval with delegation from, from what Gareth said? 
I, I suppose it just depends on, on how other members feel about that, really. If we stick to questions, I think, for the moment, and then we can come to opinions in the debate section. Uh, Councillor Webb? That's all we thought no, I was very much moving into debate, Chair, sorry. Okay. I think everybody's, well, all the questions I had have now gone again, so presumably we are happy now to move into debate, so Councillor Webber. Right, I, I, will, I will debate then. Um, I, I, Councillor Craggle, you've asked a, a very good question there, um, which is kind of why I raised the point with Gareth as, as I did. Um, as the scheme bits um i would be very uneasy to go against um highways uh, advice as it stands um i think that the the uh the, the length of the building it's not just the doors i do think the doors are important but i think the length of the building is is it's pretty close um and 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 in my mind, uh, I think the design as well. I think is something that is potentially incongruous with with the surrounding area. Um, I'm I'm not necessarily saying that's a, that it's 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 good or bad, but I, I think it's something that we need to be looked at. And I, I worry that actually, if we were to delegate this as as an uh, if we approve it with delegation, actually the thing we will be approving would actually bear no resemblance to what's in front of us today, and that's my concern, I suppose. Here, you, Councillor Fisher. Thank you. Um, this is obviously a very valued asset. This cafe and the community obviously appreciate it greatly, but we have to look at planning law. This application sticks several metres forward of a very clearly established building line. It also would have, a, in my view, a very serious effect on the immunity of the neighbouring dwelling at number 54. I'm not convinced that the design is the key here. I think it's the principle of putting a building of that size on that site and its effect on the community. After all, when the original application was put in, there was nothing at the front, no training at the front. Then we got a table and two chairs. Now, I fully understand that a gazebo has been put there. I saw that. And I understand it's necessary in the current circumstances with the pandemic. And if this application was for, say, a six month temporary application, I would be inclined to go with it to get the cafe through the pandemic. But it's not. It's for five years. And the thought of number 54 having to look at this for five years I think it would blight their property. Now, if you remember, we had an application in Balmoral Terrace where everyone was in favour of getting a, a, a shop redeveloped, but it involved putting a large dormer at the back, which I felt, and I moved the refusal of that, would have actually had a serious impact on the neighbour. That went to appeal and the inspector upheld the element that we were concerned about, which was the large dormer. You cannot throw a neighbour under a bus for the benefit of a large number of people who love us something but don't live next to it. They can support it all they want. They don't have to live with the consequences. And I'm sorry, I am moving the office, officer's recommendation of refusal. Thank you. Is anybody willing to second that? Councillor Crawshaw, I think you're just ahead of Councillor Galvin. Thanks, Chair. I, I was going to make similar points to um, Councillor Fisher's made. I'm, I'm happy to second it. Um, I think it's a, it's a really difficult um, situation here because clearly what they've demonstrated is that there is a need and uh, clearly a viable business in, in the sense of, uh, um, you know, a cafe and a focal point to the uh, local area. And, and I fully support that and would like to see that supported. But what they need is different premises that enable that to happen. That's the problem here. Um, and I think you know, it's quite clear that the original cafe would not have got permission if it included um, use of the frontage. And so to incrementally allow that is is just unfair on the neighbours. Um, and, and so it's it's unfortunate that the situation has come about, but I think we have no choice but to go with the officer recommendation. Thank you. Councillor Galvin. Chairman, Councillor Fisher really took the words out of my mouth to a certain extent. Um, it's not about uh, people sitting outside. It's not about kids sitting outside. It's about the planning conditions. If, and if you look at the recommendations, uh, it's quite clear. Um, 
and, and, and like Councillor Fisher and, 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 and Councillor Crawshaw, I'm sorry, I, I can't support this uh, at all. Um, because it, I, I went down there the other day, particularly, I was coming back from the other side of town, and rather than go out to traffic lights, I cut down there to down Broadway uh, and had a look at it. And, and really, it, it, it's going to look like a, 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 a really large sore thumb whichever way you look at it. So I, um, I, can, I, I support the officer's recommendation, Chair. Thank you. Uh, Councillor Crackhill? Um, yeah, I'd like to um, speak against refusal. Um, I think from some other comments, deferral might be a, a better option, but I'd really like to speak against refusal. This um, application has had 106 letters of support. We've heard what a tremendous contribution it's made um, as a community hub and made to the local community. When I went there this morning, it was quite clear people were using it, the, the gazebo area this morning. There were quite a number of people there. It's, it's, it, it has kind of transformed that part of the area. Um, I, I heard someone arrived who had walked there, who obviously hadn't been before and was telling someone else on their phone what a lovely place it was because there was, you know, not only the shops, but also a cafe. Um, it's a great attractor um, to, to the shops and, and, and to the other shops that are there, as well as fulfilling community facility reasons. Um, and I'm looking at policy R2 in our draft local plan that says development proposals will be supported that consolidate, maintain or improve the function, vitality and viability of the centre or parades, meaning neighbourhood parades, in relation to retail, cultural and community facilities. It's entirely in keeping with our planning policies to support this. And what on earth is planning for? It's not for the sake of ticking planning policy boxes, is it? It's supposed to be to support our communities. Um, I'm not I'm not at all convinced about the impact on number 54, uh, 54. Of course, it's a consideration that has to be has to be taken into account. But the, the whole of the forecourt of number 54, it's not used as a garden at the front. It's all paved over. Um, and as I think um, one of the speakers said, it's used mainly for parking cars. That's the area that would be adjacent to the structure itself. The, stru the, the wall at the moment is very low. The structure would put in an improved barrier um, between number 54 and the rest of the parade. Background noise in that area is high from the traffic on Broadway. Um, so I'm really not convinced about that, but I am very convinced about the value of this to the local community. And I do think we should be finding um, a way to support it. Thank you. I'll just say for my part, I, I don't guess anybody would dispute the value of the facility to the local residents. And clearly it's, there's a huge degree of support locally. Um, but for my part, there's just too many unanswered questions, particularly in terms of noise and the impact on the neighbours, uh, on the flood risk and on highways. And I, I don't see how we can um, approve an application with this many unanswered questions. And I think having been given the opportunity to do those um, reports that this is a, a refusal rather than a deferral. So that's my view. Councillor Webb. Thank you, Chair. Um, I, I, Councillor Craggill, I was, I was the one sitting on the fence and, and mooted deferral to start with. Um, but I, I, I think I'm being persuaded that um, this is a refusal situation now because it, we do have to look at the planning law and we do, through planning, have to protect local residents' amenities. And the most local of residents... Um, is going to struggle here and, and whilst I think there is an awful lot that we can do and should do to support local communities I'm not sure this planning application is the right thing and for me I would hope that um, uh, the, the local uh, the applicant um, will look at what can be done but I, I think that this application not it um, uh, and I'm sorry for that. Councillor Perry. 
Thanks, Chair. Um, I, I completely sympathise with the um, applicant and the reasons for wanting to do this. And uh, I think it's really difficult, isn't it, when so many people are in support of it and it's clearly a much loved and uh, used community facility. So I just don't think we we can really um, go against officers' recommendations on this. So, you know, I suppose there's nothing stopping the applicant coming back if they try and deal with some of the issues that are the main concerns here. But I don't feel I can support this application as it currently stands. Thank you. Um, I can't see any more raised hands at this point. So um, I think we're happy now to move to the vote. Um, Gareth, if you're able to give us a quick... Um, sorry, sorry, the chair has been moved that... Um, um, permission be refused for the three reasons stated in the agenda report. Thank you. And Louise, if you're, if you're there to conduct the vote, but, um, firstly, can I just check that all members have heard the whole debate? Stick your hand up. Fantastic. Louise, if you're still with us. I am. All right. Are we ready then, members? So when your name is called, please state if you are for, against or abstaining from the proposal to refuse the application. Um, so we've got Councillor Craghill. Uh, against. Councillor Crawshaw. For. Councillor Daubeny. For. Councillor Fisher. For. Councillor Galvin. For. Councillor Melly. For. Councillor Perrett. For. Councillor Wardby. For. Um, Councillor Webb. For. And Chair. For. For. Okay, Chair, so that's carried again um, with one against. Thank you. That's refused. If we could, members, be back at 20 to 9, we're able to turn off the videos.
Well, welcome back again, everybody. We could move straight on to item 3C, which is uh, at the rear of 5 Cherry Lane. Gareth, if you're there. Thank you, Chair. The, uh, this application is an outline application for the erection of one detached dwelling with uh, means of access. Uh, it's a resubmission. Um, members may recall the refusal of an outline application for five detached dwellings on the site that was dealt with by subcommittee in um, August of last year. I'll share my screen with an outline application. There isn't a, um, there isn't a great deal of uh, drawn information. It's come up okay. Okay, so it's the illustrative, um, the illustrative drawing. Um, as, uh, as I mentioned, it is an outline application. Um, it's only the means of access, which is, um, which is for determination and obviously the principle of the development uh, for one house. Everything else is illustrative, uh, including the, um, the, the siting of the, of the developments on the land. Um, we do have a technical drawing of the uh, of the access, which is the same design as that uh, which was considered when there were five houses um, in the proposal. We have a couple of photographs. That's um, the junction of St Edward's Close and uh, Cherry Lane, which leads down onto the Knavesmire. The site access is is uh, to the right next to that tree. That's um, through the access. The building you can see um, is the, uh, the, the, the race course stables. And then a sm uh, an area of uh, sort of ancillary land with the, uh, um, the, the skips for that use. That, um, uh, that um, fence is the, uh, the, the, the boundary of the site. And then looking up from the, uh, from the nose mile behind, um, uh, behind me uh, into the site, you can you can see the, um, the, the stables building there the boundary with the, the rear of um, five Cherry Lane. Uh, we, do have, um, we do have an update uh, that was sent to members earlier on today. We've got the, uh, the, the planning officer for the application, Alison Stockdale, who can go through that, but uh, I guess if there are any questions that members have uh, about, the, uh, about the drawings, um, I'll keep those displayed. Yeah, I can see Councillor Crawshaw. Thanks, Chair. Um, it's just around the site access, and, and apologies if this was discussed when the, the application for five dwellings came, because I wasn't on the committee on, on that occasion. Um, I'm trying to just understand the photograph that shows um, the top of um, Cherry Lane and, and St Edward's Close, which seems to have a sort of constructed, yeah, that one. It has a kind of curved way and a, and a pedestrian access and things. And presumably that's the line that the access would take and it will just remove that section of fencing that we can see on, on the image there. But I'd understood that seven metres of hedgerow gets removed to allow the access. And I'm just trying to understand if, is the seven metres of hedgerow that section where it's actually fenced off and that's classed as hedgerow or is there some additional hedgerow that's removed and, and why does that need to be removed if there's an existing access point? Um, yeah, sure. There, so there is some hedgerow um, removed um, to achieve the access. I think there were some concerns because um, residents were concerned that people going up and down Cherry Lane didn't wait. You can just see the give way lines. Well, they weren't giving way. They came through there. There was concerns about sight lines coming out of um, our site here. Um, you can see just to the right of this photo, the tree there is a TPO tree. So I think the access moves a bit further away from that to kind of give it more clearance, which needs taking out some of the hedge. There's some realignment of the road to mean that it's much more clear that you've got to stop at this give way point um, 
so it is but it is still quite a large access that's proposed for this single dwelling um, so, so so if i may just for clarity then yeah. so it's the to allow people exiting cherry lane onto this sort of short section of of, of access road it, that's the concern and the sight line that, you, that you're concerned about is that right I think it's a combination of things but I think it's for vehicles coming out of the site it's so that there's more sight line for because it is a there is vehicular access yeah. down to the Naves Mile and, so it's people coming up there and conflicts that yeah. way. yeah and and, and so just from looking on this map here then so it looks as though there's a there's a street lamp um in that corner with the um uh, pedestrian triangle sign on it so are, are we talking about seven meters of hedgerow from that point down towards the race course that are, that are to be removed um uh, yes i think it probably would be you'll have to check with the agent can i go back to that out. um yeah that might help is this shows yes so that yeah, shows i think you can just see the extent there of the there we go so you can see the, uh, the, the, the footway um, for this access road, uh, and then the extent of the hedge from there to there. Okay. Yeah, so that looks to be where, where the vehicle is sort of marked in green, looks to be approximately where the existing street lamp is. Would, mm -hmm. that, be, would that be about right? Yeah. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I can't see any further questions, so I think we're okay to take the plans down, Gareth. Did you say there was an update? Yes, there is. Right, do you want me to go through that? Um, Please. So um, there's an additional consultation response from our senior flood risk management engineer. He just noted that... Um, proper foul and surface water drainage details hadn't been provided. Although it, we conditioned on the previous application, we had conditioned drainage details, um, but perhaps they could have provided those in the time since that application was refused. But we have imposed a drainage condition again to cover that. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, it's not quite clear actually on your update, but condition three, the plans condition was intended to be amended to remove the illustrative site layout because that's a reserved matter. So to avoid any con confusion, we're not approving that site layout. That will be a, that will be a, one of the details that's submitted later if this application is approved. Um, going on additional conditions. Um, so we're to try and control the use, if you, if you remember back to the site layout, there's a large paddock area. Well, to control the use of that paddock to make sure it remains open. There's some conditions about that. So one to ensure we install a fence between the garden and the paddock. And then another condition, removing um, PD rights. And just to ensure that the house is approximately in the location that it's shown on the site layout. I think that was it all. Yes, that's the, that's the update, thank you. If there are any further questions from members, Councillor Caution. Thanks, Chair. Uh, just a couple of questions, um, if, if I may. Um, one was just to understand in the conclusion. Um, so paragraph 6.3 um, on page 83 says, given the benefits of the scheme in providing housing whilst preserving the adjacent sinks, essentially it seems to me that what we're being asked to do is say are we happy for seven meters of hedgerow to be removed to provide one single house and does that one house the benefit of that one house outweigh the um loss of the of the, the seven meters of hedgerow i know it's a bit simplified but is that is that a fair enough kind of that's what the planning balance is that we're trying to weigh up here i think there are other benefits to the sink i think We've got it conditioned so that there are management plans. So currently the sink, the hedgerow sink is unmanaged and there are issues with it overgrown. There are elements where it's just thinning. So what this application will do will ensure it's, it's long-term management 
in an appropriate fashion. So there is some benefit to the sink there from that, although I do accept that there's some removal as well. Okay, thank you. And, and if I may just ask a, a second question, Chair, um, it was just around condition four, um, which conditions the total number of dwellings shall not exceed one and that the house shall be no greater than nine metres in height. Um, and call me cynical, but we've had one or two where outline applications have been approved and then for various reasons, things have been varied a little bit from from what may have been said and and uh, i'm thinking particularly of the um application on tadcaster road that we approved a couple of months ago where it conditioned to say one story dwelling but actually we sort of accepted that height wise it was okay to have a, a two story i'm just wondering whether there's anything that we could do to make it really clear and it may be just an informative that if this were to be approved it really is just for a single dwelling of nine meters and there is you know the committee wants to be clear that we're not wanting to see any variation of that condition at any future point I don't know whether that's something that we could do within a, an informative or otherwise because I'm just a bit worried that we've had an application for five dwellings now suddenly it's been reduced all the way to one you know once if that was to get approved does do we then see in a few months time oh well actually we could do with two slightly smaller dwellings than this one large one that we've said is uh, acceptable and given how big the entrance is going to have to be it seems a lot of money to spend on that and well, yeah but they sorry you got go. no, to uh, <laughs> really um <laughs> the uh the condition is what uh, what prevents um a reserve matters application coming in for more than uh uh for more than one uh, the, the the application you refer to on Tadcaster Road I know I mean, that was, was a, that was a new application. Yeah. So, and there's nothing we can do if if the applicant keeps coming back for um, for larger schemes. We just have to deal with those applications on their own merits. But with that um, with that condition, what they what they can't do is come in with a reserve matters for um, for for two. They would have to put in either a, a variation of that condition. Uh, that can be dealt with at committee um, uh, or they would have to put in a new application but there's not really anything we can do further than that um, other than just determine applications when when they come in um, you mentioned the width of the the width of the road but that is the same what they've done is put in the um, the design details for the for the same uh, the same highway that was um, that was proposed for the five uh, that that hasn't changed, but that has been submitted to us for for determination on um, on access. I think, and Alison can um, correct me if I'm wrong, that there is a is there a condition that requires full details of the of the access. I think there was, wasn't there? Um, I'm having a look yeah, now. Yeah, I'm usually more <laughs> confident about saying which conditions it is, but uh, it's been quite a long day. Um, da, da, da. Um, yes, so condition 1920, seek to do the change of alignment on Cherry Lane and the um, access, the junction in accordance with the approved plans. Right, so that does, yeah. So that does actually, yeah. That's that's the, that's a. Um, so the drawing you saw, the submitted drawing you saw, shows that um, that's what that's what members would be approving in terms of the access. That's a question. Thank, thank you. Um, so just just back to the point around the outline application and and, and what you could or couldn't do um, afterwards. And and as I say, I, I appreciate that we could potentially grant an outline. And then they could come back with a, uh, you know, a completely new application, and we'd, we'd have to deal with that again. Um, could you just explain why this is an outline application rather than just a straightforward application to build a new property on? Is, is there a particular reason why? Because I understand outlines when you're talking about a large development, and you know, you're not quite clear of all the details. It just seems a little bit. I'm not quite clear why we're looking at an outline application for a single dwelling rather than just a normal application it might be a question for the um for the agent but um there's you're right we don't see in york we don't see that many outline applications except for the you know significantly larger 
residential schemes. Um, I don't know that's if that's because we've got so many conservation areas that applicants and uh, are just used to putting in um, full applications for whatever they do because we don't accept outline applications in conservation areas. Um, I, I can't really answer the question more than that. They're, they're entitled to do it. Uh, it saves them um, some uh, some money on uh, on design fees and drawing up full full plans for the drawings. But that's uh, um, that's probably really the only benefit it gives an applicant. I think. Okay, thanks. Because they certainly have to provide the same level of reports. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Crackell. Uh, thank you. Yes, apologies if I'm just not quite keeping up with this one, but could you just clarify going back to the entrance, um, the access, um, access, and you said it's as wide as as the one was the previous one. It's the same as one was for five. Is that is that needed for safety reasons anyway, or or what is, or if not, why why is it still so wide? Could I bring in the Traffic and Highways Development Manager. Good evening. Um, my name is Ellen Drusser. I'm the Traffic and Highway Development Manager. Um, we could look at changing the width of the access for only one dwelling. It's just not been something we've looked at with this one, um, Alison. It was just not proposed by the applicant, was it? No, no. So it's not deemed essential for safety reasons. The previous one obviously had a lot more dwellings, but with yeah. one dwelling we could do with a reduced width. I think right. we would still want to review the alignment because of the yeah. safety issue of the, the lane going to the race course. We've had, um, especially it, it's mainly about school children um, crossing the Navesmire on their bikes and things like this, you know, not, not always respecting the current priorities. So trying to make that a bit clearer. Um, okay. I would still like to do that. Right. Thank you. Just to make the point, I think that's uh, it would be a good idea to look at it again because obviously the the hedgerow is important, and twenty one meters is in fact sixty three feet, um, and that's quite a long distance to me. Um, although I appreciate the need for a good sight line for safety, um, for especially for for youngsters who haven't yet taken their driving test and they're, they're on a bicycle and they've rushed out of school and they're full of full of uh, the, the joys of uh, freedom and so on but um yeah let's let's if we could look at that one again i think it would be useful because this this hedge is important to conserve does that require a change to the condition Ellen, or is it essentially covered anyway in i think we'd need to sorry Ellen. i i, I think we would need to um Defer the application because it's it's been submitted as um, as a matter for consideration. So we have to consider it. Um, so it would need an amended drawing to be submitted at this stage. Oh, sorry, Alison, have I? Am I, I, add, I think I think the agent might say that he would be happy to um, add access to the reserve matters if that would resolve that issue today. He did originally say that they, they would like to continue with access, but he's confirmed now he'll probably say it when he speaks. But if removing access to a reserve matter would solve it, then they're happy to do that. And we could look at access again then. Okay, that would seem sensible. Okay, I can't see any further questions. So if we do move on then to our speaker, Mr. Eamon Keogh. Speaking in support of the scheme, we can hear you. Yes, I can hear you, Chair. Can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you. Yeah, and you know. Great, you know, okay, thanks. Yeah. Yep, you know the drill. <laughs> thanks for this opportunity to speak. Um, I think the officer's report uh, provides a comprehensive summary and the appraisal of the application proposals. Uh, although it's an outline application, we have incorporated many sustainability features that you would find in a, in a full application and given a commitment to those in the design access statement. Following the rejection of the previous proposals, we revisited the scheme to address members' concerns about the impact on the green corridor and the character and setting of the race course. So we have one dwelling at the west end of the site in the way that other dwellings are along St. Edward's Close and new planting is proposed on the 
east boundary to the race course, which will reduce, if not completely remove, the visibility of the house from the race course. Uh, the proposed maintenance shed on the race course stable, of course, will add further screening to our dwelling. Uh, the access has been designed to provide traffic calming measures that will slow down traffic on Cherry Lane as it approaches the site, which St. Edward's close, uh, as was discussed. And that was a matter that was of uh, some concern to residents with the previous proposal. That's why we kept this scheme, this this, this particular access in. Um, yeah, for if, if if members are concerned that it may that it could be revisited as a design, uh, I'm happy to give uh, a, a commitment here and, and to or to say that we would uh, add happy to add access as a reserve matter, which would mean that we could come back uh, with proposals uh, for um, re- an access for the one dwelling along with the other reserve matters. So I'm happy to give that commitment now um, to avoid a, a, a deferral which I don't think anybody wants. Uh, um, the site uh, has no designation on the draft local plan proposals map. It's an unallocated site in a sustainable location in the urban area. It has uh, The site has low ecological value other than the hedgerow, which, which has been discussed, which is a designated site of nature interest. It should be pointed out that this is a local designation. It's not a, a national and it's not a statutory designation. Um, but the hedgerow is in danger of losing what ecological value it has because of a uh, it, it, basically, it's degrading over time. For example, it has some ash within there that's, that's suffering from ash dieback. So it needs active maintenance, which uh, we're proposing as part of the scheme. Um, the, the, the loss of a few meters, seven meters or so of the hedgerow, uh, if the, which may be reduced now with a, re, with a revised access, will be only 4.3% of its, of its length. And the scheme has been specifically designed to preserve the vast majority of the hedgerow. Um, the officer report refers to new planting along the south boundary. But it should be pointed out that this planting includes approximately 160 metres of new hedgerow planting, as well as tree planting along the boundary. So the views that you saw of the skips, when you look through the side entrance, they would disappear uh, with the new landscaping that we're proposing along that boundary. And the, the, where you saw those skips in the photograph that um, Garrett showed is about the location of where the race course would have its maintenance shed. Um, uh, finally, in terms of the the, the site being considered a local plan for housing. Um, it was considered in the January 2018 local plan working group and officers advised at that time that the whole site could be considered as a housing allocation if members wish to make additional housing provision, uh, but that suggestion was not carried forward by members. So the point here is that the site was uh, was not allocated, not because it was unsuitable for housing as such, but simply because members considered that the additional numbers were not needed at that time. Um, so happy to um, answer uh, any questions that members might have. Thank you, Councillor Crawshaw. Thanks, uh, thanks, Chair, and, and good evening, uh, Eamon. Um, I'm just, um, I guess it's the same question as, as I posed, really, about the, the, you know, why you've gone for an outline rather than a full application, and and I just would like some if you're able to give it, and I appreciate it's not a planning issue as such, but um, you know, can you can you just confirm that the applicant is intending to develop the site? Because um, it seems to me possibly that this is maybe a get an outline on the site and then it's got some more value. Well, no, the, the, uh, the site uh, may well be offered for sale. And in that case, it would be uh, a bit premature to be designing a fully worked up dwelling for uh, a buyer or, or someone else who may wish to put a different design different design house on the side. Okay, thank you. I, I, the, the reason I'm asking is because I just want, if, if that's the case, we just need to be very mindful of making sure conditions are yeah, sure, yeah. Um, applying what you're saying you'd be happy to have going to, into yeah. reserve matters, if you see what I mean. Yeah. So, yeah, sure. Thank, thank you. Okay, thank you. Um, I can't see any further questions, so I think just thank you for your time this evening. Appreciate it. It's got quite late now, so thank you. <laughs> thank you. Okay, then. Are there any further questions for officers? Can't see any, so if I'm happy then to move into debate. Anybody would like to? Councillor Galvin? Muted. Chairman, we can beat this to death for the next hour, uh, but I'm quite convinced that we've got everything we want, and I'm going to move the officer's recommendations, and let's not drag this torture out any longer. 
Anybody willing to second that? Councillor Fisher? Yeah, just nothing further to say. Uh, just the additional conditions concerning the um, boundary fence. Uh, I think it's uh, as long as the building is built roughly where it is and doesn't impinge on the TPO tree, I think it's an acceptable application. Thank you. Anything further, Councillor Crawshaw? Thanks, Chair. Yeah, I, I'm still concerned about condition four, just um, not being clear enough that, uh, you know, I appreciate it's the condition, it is what it is, but I think I've seen enough times when an outline application comes forward with one thing and then uh, a subsequent full application comes in, citing the fact that there's already a, an approved outline for X and therefore we'll have Y, please. Um, and I think we just need to perhaps put in an informative that makes it very clear that this is only expected to be one dwelling on this site if that's what we're, we're going for approval given that the committee refused five dwellings because it was concerned about prote protecting the green corridor and, and um, you know maintaining that kind of openness of the, of the Navesmire. Okay, Councillor Galvin, Councillor Fisher, is that So we're quite frank, uh, I think it's a, it's not necessary. I think it's a total nonsense. But if if uh, if my colleague Councillor Fisher thinks it's the end, I'm not going to argue about it. But it's a complete utter nonsense. I don't think it adds any value, but we can put it in if you want to do. I'm not averse to it, but I don't think it adds anything. If they want to come back with an application for two houses, that is within their right. There's nothing we can do to stop that. Well, I think on the basis, if two people aren't bothered and one is then we may as well. Uh, Councillor Craghill. Uh, yes, I might just be getting tired and I've missed this, but have we um, now got something in that actually requires um, um, that, that, that the means of access is part of reserved matters? Chair, sure, no, I was going to raise that. Um... It, uh, as it stands, the access is part of the proposal, and if members were to approve it, they would be approving the access as shown on those drawings. Um, my suggestion: uh, it would have the the applicant would formally have to alter the application. My suggestion is that uh, if members wish that uh, access to be changed, then uh, you uh, delegate um, to officers to approve uh, subject to the applicant with um, withdrawing the means of access from the uh, from the application. Gavin seems happy, Councillor Fisher. Yep, that sounds like a good... Right, better write that down forward. before I forget. I can't see anybody else wanting to speak, so I think we've probably reached the point where we come to you, Gareth, to... Right. Um, what I just said. Um, so, uh, delegate approval uh, to um, the, um, the, the head of uh, development services um, sub to approve... Um, in accordance with the conditions laid out, set out in the report, as amended by uh, the table conditions, subject to prior confirmation by the applicant that they wish the um, withdrawal of the um, means of access from the list of um, uh, matters to be considered. Sandra's turned up. I noticed awesome. that. Uh, Chair Sandra Brannigan from Legal Services. Sorry, Gareth, may maybe you were coming on to this, um, but I think you also need to amend condition two to require that reserve matters are submitted for means of access. Yes, I wondered who'd spot that first. Sorry, um, you're, you're coming to it. No, I wasn't. Thank you, Chair. I, I thought about it, but I hadn't uh, mentioned it. So, and then subject to any consequential changes to the, um, uh, to the conditions informative which reads we really 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 mean it yes okay yes okay yeah 
Louise, if you're about to conduct the vote, I'll just check with all members. Yeah, just just a point of Sorry. clarification. Um, Gareth definitely said defer to to officers to approve. Then is that is that actually what Councillor Galvin and Councillor Fisher proposed and seconded? They were happy when suggested. Yeah, delegates. To delegates. Yes. Okay. Sorry, can members then just indicate as well you've compared the whole debate? I think that's everyone. Thank you. Sorry, Louise. No, that's fine. Right. Okay, right. So, members, again, when your name is called, please state if you are for, against, or abstaining um, from the proposals. So, Councillor Craghill. Uh, four. Councillor Crawshaw. Four. Councillor Daubeny. Four. Councillor Fisher. Four. Councillor Galvin. Four. Councillor Melly. Four. Councillor Perrett. Four. Councillor Wardby. Four. Councillor Webb. Four. And Councillor Holly as chair. Four. Right, okay, that's everyone in agreement then. So that's carried. Thank you. Um, so, yes, yeah, so all that remains is just to thank everybody for your time this evening, particularly to sort of behind the scenes offices and, and Gareth as always for being sort of target for five hours. So thank you. We'll see you next time. Okay, thank you. Yes. Good evening.